think uh, President uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, Babu to deliver President's letters. Good evening, all. Respected seniors, respected Secretary Dr. Rajendran sir, and respected uh, Treasurer Dr. Gopal Subramaniam, respected uh, past President Dr. Muhammad Ismail, President elect Dr. Suresh Balan sir, Dr. Uh, Anamalai Vijay Raghavan sir, our Vice President. And our uh, central IAP EP members, Dr. Aram Spendil sir, and uh, Kipili, Dr. Tirumurayan Seren, and other uh, office bearers of IAP EP members, Dr. Rajendran sir, and respected Tashinar, uh, Dr. Gopal Subramaniam, of IAP TNSC, and uh, respected uh, delegates and all the participants. It's a great pleasure from IAP TNSC uh, to participate in this event. Um, I welcome all of you. Um, I have just uh, one uh, request from all of you uh, that um, we have got only one more month um, to increase our membership strength to from existing four to five. So we have to uh, improve our membership at least by 150 number members so that we will be eligible for the 50 EB member. I request all of you to uh, concentrate on membership promotion of uh, Central IAP so that you'll be able to get uh, one more uh, member for our state representing from our state to Central IAP. The short note, I wish the, the all the chairperson, delegates, convener, and all the speakers, respected the faculties uh, who will be introduced by Dr. Rajendran sir. With the short note not taking much of time. I thanks for I thank you all for this opportunity. Over to Dr. Rajendran sir to proceed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, respected our president, uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu, President elect uh, Dr. Suresh Balan, and uh, President 2021, Dr. Ismail, and uh, Joint Secretary, Dr. J. Bal Subramaniam, and uh, our uh, uh, Vice President, Dr. Anamalai Vijayaragaman. And uh, AAA, Dr. Thir Thirumurugan Sarani, and Editor Dashaini, other, uh, our uh, senior past president, Dr. Arun Sindhil sir, and uh, all other uh, central as well as uh, state uh, EB members on um, behalf of IAPT NSA, welcome. Uh, first, uh, it's a very important CME because uh, uh, many times we had a uh, uh, pediatric radiology and uh, spoken by our uh, Pediatrician. Now it's exclusively pediatrician who is on doing very good work in uh, pediatric radiology aspect. They are uh, and foremost they are having very youngsters. They are having uh, very dynamic things and they are having going for interventional as well as uh, uh, even national level speakers also. And they are uh, we are thankful to they are great as a faculty. And again, on behalf of IAPT, we say welcome uh, all the delegates. First, I welcome Chairperson Dr. Uh, Vengdesh Varnsar, he was the uh, past president of uh, IAP TNC and uh, he's uh, a radiologist also and uh, from pediatrician. I welcome Dr. Vengdesh sir. Thank you, sir. I welcome uh, today's program convener, Dr. Kannan uh, Gunasegaran. He's uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, pediatric radiology work and uh, I welcome Dr. Kannan. Thank you, sir. I welcome um, today's speakers, Dr. Th Santos. Dr. Ram Kumar and Dr. Pudiyavan, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, Dr. Sri Rama Vadarajan. They are going to talk about various topics um, and, uh, shortly. On behalf of IAPT, I welcome uh, all the speakers and as well as uh, faculties also. And I welcome Dr. Srinivasan sir, he is uh, a senior pediatrician, he is here. And I uh, welcome uh, Anandal. Now it is uh, my ask Dr. Vengadesh uh, sir to felicitate Dr. Vengadesh sir. Uh, dear friends, first of all, I thank uh, the organizers, our office bearers of IAPTNSC for having given me this opportunity. Respected President Dr. Amish Babu, uh, um, respected uh, Secretary Dr. Ajendran and Treasurer Dr. Gopal Subramaniam and all the office bearers of the IAPTNSC, uh, both uh, EB members of uh, Central and uh, State uh, IAP, as well as all the uh, uh, delegates who are attending and all the faculties. So this is the first time ever, I don't think that uh, an exclusive CME only for pediatric radiology 
have been dedicated previously not even at the central level usually pediatric radiology could be one of the topic among various other topics and uh, i'm really very happy that to uh, various topics uh, based on uh, uh, nuclear medicine interventional radiology uh, uh, neonatal respiratory distress and uh, uh, neuro emergencies and neuro imaging all these uh, things congenital heart disease so these are all most important topics uh, for our day to day practice both at the rural level as well as in the uh, tertiary level so this will be one of the most uh, useful uh, cme for and that to uh, different cme because uh, we were discussing all these times what we have uh, talked repeatedly but this is the first time that uh, we are going to have a cme exclusively on pediatric radiology on different topics thank you thank you dr rajendran you can proceed uh, yeah thank you dr vignesan sir now i request uh, dr kannan munasegaran um, uh, is a pro program uh, convener to felicitate uh, thank you sir uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity um, this uh, interesting uh, topic because uh, we spoke uh, usually with radiologists this is the first time we are sp uh, spoke with uh, consultants pediatricians uh, pediatrics actually they have so many sub specializations pediatric neuro pediatric uh, orthopedics so many things are there uh, sub specialty if you take radiology uh, there are so many sub specialties msk radiology cardiac radiology uh, intervention radiologist uh, there are so many thing but in pediatric radiology itself they have sub specialization if you go to european countries or canada uh, there are pediatric cardiac imaging fellowship pediatric intervention fellowship pediatric msk fellowship so pediatric radiology itself it's uh, going uh, sub specialized super specialized i can so uh, there are so many specialization in pediatric radiology itself uh, so that's why it's uh, treating handling the pediatrics itself it's a very difficult one the pediatric radiology also it's very uh, difficult and challenging one that's why uh, we practicing pediatric radiology more uh, very interestingly so i don't want to waste our time uh, our first speaker uh, santos uh, he finished his ug and pg in jipmer and he joined kmch for last 10 years he is with kmch and he finished uh, intervention fellowships and he is uh, so he gave so many talks on national level um, he is very good academician and very good intervention radiologist so this uh, he will guide uh, or he will uh, share his experience in pediatric intervention radiology thank you uh, santosh uh, thank you dr kanan for the kind words so i will start sharing my screen right away <clears throat> so can you all see my screen yes sir yeah. we can visualize yeah yeah okay. please proceed <clears throat> thank you sir so at the outset i would like to thank the indian academy of pediatrics uh, uh, dr rajendran sir dr kanan and everyone who have given me this opportunity to present uh, before the uh, esteemed panel and i like to discuss about pediatric intervention radiology during this particular lecture and i work as a consultant in the intervention radiology division at kmch coimbatore uh so what is intervention radiology we do specific image guided procedures which are minimally invasive and uh, take the guidance of ultrasound or ct or fluoroscopy or even uh, 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 sophisticated angiographic suits to perform uh, minimally invasive highly targeted procedures in various parts of the body it can be as simple as an ultrasound guided biopsy to complex neurovascular procedures which are performed through vascular access most commonly the femoral artery so intervention radiology is a very young specialty it started in the late 1900s and it is growing very rapidly because of various technological advancements that are happening every day and uh, various uh, modalities and various uh, hardware are coming to practice which are greatly changing the landscape of treatment of various diseases 
We offer simple to complex solutions to diseases from head to toe, right, starting from the brain to peripheral vascular disease involving the food. Uh, we are quite minimally invasive. Uh, as, as such, children need minimally invasive or gentle procedures. And among all the surgical procedures or uh, invasive procedures, we are the least invasive. Nevertheless, we are maximally precise because all of our procedures are carried out under uh, sophisticated imaging guidance. And all this leads to rapid recovery compared to traditional surgical procedures with minimal mobility, particularly in children who actually are greatly benefited by these procedures. So what do we actually do? We can have non-vascular procedures and vascular procedures. So these non-vascular procedures are image-guided biopsies, drainages, uh, and uh, 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 procedures like ablation of tumors and percutaneous sclerotherapy. And vascular procedures like angiography, diagnostic angiography of various structures, various parts of the body, insertion of lines, catheters, and uh, chemoports to aid in uh, various infusions and dialysis, and uh, installation of chemotherapy into particular structures like in retinoblastoma. And most of our procedures can be broadly categorized under two headings. One is embolization, which is uh, intentional blocking of a vessel. And we do this in situations like bleeding or for decreasing the vascular supply of a tumor to cause shrinkage or uh, to make it uh, suitable for surgical excision. Or we can block an artery venous malformation, which can lead on to various consequences. So the other group of procedures uh, come under revascularization, which is opening up of a vessel. And it can be uh, used in various situations like stroke or acute lip ischemias, acute mesenteric ischemias, and other vasoocclusive diseases. And also in renal vascular hypertension, when there is a renal artery stenosis, and we can open uh, and stent the renal artery to decrease the hypertension. So these are the various kinds of procedures uh, under which our, uh, most of our procedures fall into. So we start with certain procedures. Uh, I have structured this presentation to introduce you to various procedures that we do, uh, the various diseases that we treat, the basics of those diseases, and how do we move about our procedures. So it's like a kind of an introductory uh, session on intervention radiology per se. The most simple of our procedures are image-guided biopsies and drainages. So structures or uh, lesions which are not amenable for direct biopsy, like in thorax and abdomen, or in the spine, or in deep structures of the neck where uh, vital structures are there, biopsy of these lesions can actually be guided to a great extent by ultrasound or CT or even fluoroscopy in specific situations. Because uh, under image guidance, you can see in this picture, we uh, exactly see where our needle or the biopsy gun goes and where we are taking the biopsy from. So it gives us a great uh, uh, accuracy in actually sampling the right tissue. And this can be done with uh, sedation or general anesthesia for young children who do not uh, uh, traditionally tolerate local anesthesia. Or for older children, we can perform all these procedures under local anesthesia itself. We always check the coagulation parameters before any percutaneous procedure, and that includes a PTINR or a platelet count. Uh, we also perform drainages of various fluid collection and abscesses in the body. For pleural effusion or ascites, which is medically refractory, we can place catheters, drainage catheters, we can, <clears throat> or we can do a therapeutic aspiration of the fluid collection. We can remove pus from any part of the body, which is not amenable for naked aspiration, like in the subcutaneous plane. And uh, we do these procedures under ultrasound guidance predominantly and in certain situations, CT guidance. We can also place indwelling catheters, like pigtail catheters, as in this case, which is placed in a case of an appendicular rupture and abscess or we can plate catheters called malicot catheters, which can be uh, placed in uh, larger collections. So uh, I'll move on to different diseases. And uh, one of the common benign tumors in childhood and early adulthood is osteoblastoma, which is uh, nothing but a, a, a compact lesion, a small lesion with an osteoid, which is unmineralized bone at the center and uh, a <clears throat> thick rim of mineralized cortical bone. It's usually located in the cortex of uh, metaphyseal regions of various bones. Here we have a 11 year old boy with uh, presenting with right medial thigh pain and an osteoblastoma in the uh, right uh, upper metaphyseal femur. This, these lesions are classically very painful, particularly in the night, and they respond very well to NSAIDs. But some lesions who are recalcitrant or refractory to NSAIDs, we can actually offer definitive treatment in the form of a surg surgical curatage or an ablation procedure, which is a minimally invasive procedure. 
and uh, this minimally invasive ablation procedure is a preferred one because it uh, it has uh, a lot of less morbidity compared to a surgical cure touch so <clears throat> in this patient we have uh, done a ct guided uh, rf ablation it was performed by dr venkatesh in our department who is in charge of the ablative therapies this is an rf ablation uh, rf ablation probe which is inserted via a bone biopsy needle and targeted right into the nidus of the or the osteoid of the osteoid osteoma and this is the ablation zone of the uh, rf probe which is directly placed within the lesion and when the current is applied the rf probe actually heats the lesion and results in coagulative necrosis of the osteoid so that greatly decreases the symptoms of the patient ultimately it mineralizes and the lesion is cured so aneurysmal bone cyst is another lesion which is benign and uh, expansile multiloculated cystic which can be located in any part of the uh, skeleton and it consists mostly of osteoclasts and uh, non epithelialized uh, non non endothelialized vascular spaces which can actually bleed and cause severe pain it can be progressive it is also seen in the uh, late childhood and early, early adulthood it causes progressive uh, weakness of the bone instability and even fractures so treatment options when patients are symptomatic they include surgical curettage uh, with bone grafting with or without preoperative embolization because there is a very vascular tumors can lead on to a uh, lot of lots of bleeding in trop so we can preoperatively embolize this tumor and do a surgical excision but not all uh uh <clears throat> aneurysmal bone cysts can be surgically excised like in a fibula we can it's an expendable bone so surgical excision is curative but in other bones which cannot be expended so these lesions have these uh, uh abcs have a lot of morbidity with surgery so percutaneous sclerotherapy is a viable alternative to surgery and agents like polydocolon and uh, sodium tetrahydrochloride sulfate are good spirosins which can actually denature the uh the covering of the vascular spaces and cause progressive sclerosis of the lesions and decrease in pain so this is a 13 year old boy who presented with uh, left arm pain on x-ray we found an expansive lytic bubbly lesion which was confirmed as abc on uh, aneurysmal bone cyst on an mri and here on the last picture we can see multiple needles which were percutaneously placed under fluoroscopic guidance into the various cystic spaces after confirming with contrast injection we have injected uh, a sclerosant agent called polydocolon which, uh, which when injected in multiple sittings this is not a procedure which we do in a single sitting we do over a period of time every month we do a sitting of a sclerotherapy infusion into these cystic spaces and progressively over 6 uh, to 12 months we see actual sclerosis that is happening within the lesion and decrease in symptoms over the long run there are various uh, applications of ablative procedures and one of the most common uh, uses is ablation of uh, pediatric malignancies so these are preferred mostly in patients who are not candidates for surgery the, the, the staging the stage of the tumor is beyond uh, surgical cure and it's used as a palliative option in pediatric age group or as an adjunct to surgery the common malignancies that are treated via this uh, uh, procedure include lung metastasis from sarcomas primary and secondary liver malignancies bone and soft tissue cancers so there are various modalities of ablation the commonly used ones are rf and microwave uh, rf is radio frequency and microwave ablation which are uh, actually heat based or thermal based ablation procedures they we also have cryoablation which is a rarely used one and also ethanol injection which is very uh, which is the most traditional of the all the ablations is a chemical ablation so we move on to vascular interventions after uh, having a brief look on the non vascular interventions among the vascular interventions the neurovascular procedures are one of the most complex procedures that we get to do and uh, with the advent of intervention radiology uh, and various technological advancements in the microcatheters and various embolizing agents these procedures have become more and more safe compared to what it was a few decades back uh, acute ischemic stroke is a very rare condition in children although it is common in adults uh, children do have strokes and the incidence is increasing because more and more children survive uh, with congenital heart disease due to the advancement of uh, <coughs> surgical treatment in congenital heart disease so uh, as these uh, children with the various other comorbidities survive to early childhood or adulthood they uh, they can have devastating stroke 
and uh, pediatric stroke is of various uh, etiologies and various presentations unlike adult stroke which actually is easily recognizable so the presentation may be uh, something uh, as weird as uh, somnolence prolonged somnolence or irritability to uh, frank uh, neuro deficit in the form of hemiplegia or aphasia unlike in adults plain ct is not enough to initiate treatment in adults we know that a plain ct is enough if the ct doesn't show hemorrhage we can initiate iv thrombolysis within the uh, time period of 4 and 1/2 hours but in pediatric age group plain ct is not enough because there are various various mimics of acute stroke and all of them have cannot be ruled out with a plain ct and uh, iv thrombolysis is not recommended with a plain ct alone so uh, preferably mr or a ct angio is necessary to uh, document or confirm the presence of infarction brain infarction and also to diagnose the vessel that is occluded according to the 2017 which is the most la latest uh, rcpch guidelines we can administer iv thrombolysis or do a procedure called mechanical thrombectomy which is an intervention removal of a clot in eligible children who are more than 2 years with a, a sizable neurological deficit with an nhs score of 4 to 6 and salvageable brain on imaging within 4 and 1/2 hours for lysis and 12 hours for mechanical thrombectomy so what is a salvageable brain so when a vessel gets occluded during an acute stroke what happens to the brain territory that it supplies the brain territory that it supplies undergoes progressive infarction starting from the uh, region close to the vessel that is occluded so the the uh, tissue that is irreversibly infarcted is called the core and the tissue which is ischemic but not yet infarcted is called the penumbra the penumbra is kept alive by various collaterals that can come from the anterior cerebral artery or the posterior cerebral artery in case of an mc occlusion and these collaterals though not permanent can give us a window where we can go in and take out this clot and actually help uh, the penumbra to survive so this is the thing that we do with av uh, intravenous lysis or with mechanical thrombectomy so here we have a 17 year old boy with down syndrome who presented to us with right hemiplegia and aphasia for the duration of 2 hours so on uh, mri the patient had a confirmed infarction of the left basal ganglia region and on perfusion imaging we can see the perfusion defect is quite large compared to the small core that is seen on the diffusion image so that means there is a large penumbra and on mr angiogram there was an occlusion of the left mca so we took the patient to lab we we did a dsa of the left common carotid or the internal carotid artery and we documented the presence of an m1 occlusion m1 is the first segment of the M mca on the left side so after that we proceeded with mechanical thrombectomy with a specialized device called a stent retriever which when deployed across the clot it catches the clot and the whole device can be pulled out along with the clot and that is called uh, <coughs> stent retriever thrombectomy and post the thrombectomy we could see that we can see that the vessel is completely open with normal filling of these branches the child had an uh, uneventful recovery after a period of 24 hours the child regained the full power and was walking after 24 hours so that is the power of immediately removing the clot with a minimal damage that is existent and uh, having a complete neurological recovery moving on to brain av malformations uh, although these are thought they, they those, these were thought as congenital lesions they are not actually congenital they are actually developmental lesions because they manifest later in childhood or early adulthood they are rare in children uh, <clears throat> and most of them in pediatric age group present uh, with hemorrhage nearly 75% of these patients present with hemorrhage whereas this is not that common in adults rest of the rest of these children present with intractable seizures so there are three various uh, three three kinds of modalities which can actually use be used to treat the brain avms the first and foremost is surgery which is uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, the most uh, robust of all the three modalities which which can actually excise the whole nidus of the avm and result in cure but not all avms are amenable to surgery because avms located near eloquent areas or having a complex venous drainage in the form of deep veins are not amenable for surgery because they can cause various complications and morbidity uh, so there are uh, two other modalities namely radio surgery which is stereotactic uh, uh, gamma knife knife guided radio surgery or uh, an endovascular embolization which is an interventional procedure these procedures have a lesser morbidity because when used in the correct situation so radio surgery can be used for smaller lesions within 3 to 5 cm although they take a longer time to cure like 1 1 to 2 years 
embolization actually uh, treats the lesion instantaneously but because of the long standing nature of the disease process the, the various complications can occur during endovascular embolization so small avms uh, with the simple architecture can be cured with embolization but a uh, larger complex avm needs a staged embolization or an urgent procedure like surgery or radio surgery for the following embolization to actually cure the patient uh these avms are more prone for recurrence in children because they continue to develop or progress further and hence periodic follow up is necessary even after complete occlusion of the avm so avm is nothing but absence of a capillary bed and direct communication between the artery and uh, vein uh, via a nidus which is a tuft of uh, abnormal vessels so we have a 16 year old female who presented with acute onset left hemiplegia and uh, right frontal bleed the child had a small avm in the right frontal lobe supplied by mca branches and had a superficial venous drainage so it was a fairly simple avm it can be treated by surgery also but uh, <clears throat> uh, here in this case it's also amenable to endovascular embolization as we can see from this 4d cerebral angiogram so this patient underwent a uh, endovascular procedure we can see the microcatheter in the mca branches reaching on to the nidus and uh, with injection of a liquid embolic agent called squid we can totally obliterate the avm and result in complete cure of the avm with a simple procedure which lasts hardly half an hour so with that uh, we have to keep on following up these patients because these patients can manifest with new avms or uh, progressive avm in the future Uh, one of the rare uh, malformations, uh, vascular malformations in pediatric age group, that too in the neonatal age group, is vein of Galen malformation, which is nothing but a persistent pro pro uh, mesencephalic vein, uh, through to which uh, many arteries can fistulize, right, starting from the branches of the ACA, MCA, and coronal branches of the PCA. The manifestations can either be in the early neonatal period or in the uh period of uh, uh during the first year of life where the child can present with a uh, developmental delay or hydrocephalus or enlarging head circumference in the early neonatal period there can be a uh, uh, severe refractory cardiac failure due to the high flow shunt and this uh, is one of the indications to intervene in the neonatal period but you when uh, the child survives the neonatal period without any uh, issues then the child can be best treated during the 6 to 12 month window period if the child has manifestations like developmental delay or uh progressively increasing head circumference or hydrocephalus endovascular treatment is the only treatment that is possible in these patients and most of the time it is very complex we have to do a staged embolization to cure these lesions here's a child with a choroidal type of uh, uh, vein of galen malformation with multiple small vessels feeding the uh, uh, artery venous shunt so in these cases apart from uh, taking an intra arterial route to take off the large fistula the small feeders cannot be addressed by a intra arterial route so we go transvenous and uh, embolize the sac with multiple coils and at the end after several sittings we can uh, find a cure of this uh, av malformation or vein of galen malformation the other group of lesions are keratico cavernous fistulas which are quite rare in children if it occurs in children is mostly a post traumatic direct keratico cavernous fistula where uh, there is a uh, there is communication between the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus the child presents with pulsatile exophthalmos and chemosis and endovascular coiling of the cavernous sinus is the treatment of choice we have a 3 year old boy with pulsatile proptosis of the right eye uh, on angiogram we could see a combined direct and indirect type of keratic cavernous fistula which is quite rare in childhood and uh, we could uh, the only treatment possible is endovascular and we reach the right cavernous sinus through the left cavernous sinus through the inferior petrosal sinus and once we reached there we confirmed and we embolized the sac with coils so once we uh, embolized the sac cavernous sac with coils we can see that the whole uh, lesion is obliterated and the child who had a pulsatile proptosis was nearly normal while discharged after 3 days the other category of vascular malformations can be in the spine there are various kinds of spinal vascular malformations right starting from uh, a glomus avm which can be seen within the substance to perimedullary av fistula which can be over the surface so these are common in ch childhood there are devastating complications when these lesions manifest like paraplegia or bladder bowel incontinence if not diagnosed and treated at the right time they can have uh, severe uh, refractory neurological complications most of these lesions are better treated by endovascular route as they are less morbid we have we recently had an 8 year old girl who presented with acute low back pain and hypotonia in the lower limbs without bladder and bowel disturbance 
on the MR, there was a suspicion of a vascular malformation. And when we did the angiogram, we found actually a perimetrally AV fistula starting from the L3 lumbar artery. We took a microcatheter right up to the uh, uh, site of the fistula and embolized the fistula with NBCA glue, which is a liquid embolic agent. So once the fistula was embolized, the child from the next day started improving drastically. And now the child is walking after three to four days. So that's a very dramatic improvement that we get with such procedures. Retinoblastomas are pediatric tumors which are exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy. And uh, uh, being children, they don't tolerate the chemotherapy well uh, if administered system systemically. And the uh, uh, thing that is tried out is intra-arterial infusion into the ophthalmic artery of uh, specific chemotherapic agents like melphalan and topotecan, which can greatly reduce the systemic side effects. So we enter the common carotid artery, we take an angiogram, we identify the ophthalmic artery, which is arising from the carotid siphon, and we cannulate the ophthalmic artery with the help of a microcatheter and infuse the drugs over a period of 30 minutes, both melphalan and topotecan. And this child had bilateral retinoblastomas, which uh, actually got completely cured at one month follow-up. So this is a very minimally invasive treatment, which gives a lot of concentration of the agent into the uh, eye that is affected without systemic toxicity. Then we move on to other body and peripheral interventions that uh, we treat day to day. Vascular malformations are a group of disease uh, processes which are actually common in childhood but often misdiagnosed and maltreated. So they can be vascular tumors, which are hemangiomas, which are soft tissue lesions, or vascular malformations, which are dysplastic vessels. They can again be divided into high flow malformation and low flow malformation. High flow malformations are malformations which are AV malformations, which are high flow resulting in a shunt directly between the artery and the vein, whereas low flow malformations or slow flow malformations are either uh, totally composed of uh, venous uh, sacs or lymphatic sacs or a combination of venous and lymphatic sacs. Most of these conditions can actually be diagnosed accurately with ultrasound and higher investigations like MRI or CT are necessary only for uh, 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 evaluating the extent or depth of uh, these lesions. For AVMs, we do embolization as we have already seen the brain. And for slow flow venous malformations, we do sclerotherapy for either venous or lymphatic. So here we have a three month old girl who presented with a slow onset of uh, proptosis of the right eye with an acute worsening over the past few days. And then uh, we on imaging, we found a large lymphatic malformation with blood fluid levels within. This lesion was treated with percutaneous sclerotherapy using bleomycin under fluoroscopic guidance. And at one month follow-up, we could observe that the proptosis settled and most of these lesions were totally obliterated. So that is, that is a very uh, minimally invasive treatment for such a drastic manifestation. Uh, children can also have excessive bleeding in post-traumatic situations or in situations like uh, uh, GI bleed or in coagulopathic states like dengue. All these conditions, uh, uh, we have highly evolved microcatheters which can actually reach the exact site of bleed uh, in any part of the body. And with the specific agents like coils, glues, or particles, we can block the bleeding vessel accurately. So here we have a seven-year-old boy who had a road traffic accident present with shock. The patient had an active extravasation on CT in the left lobe of liver. And we could accurately observe the ex extravasation in the angiogram of the celiac artery. And we reached the exact vessel leading onto the extravasation and blocked it to achieve a cure in this patient. So this patient immediately had, uh, will, these patients will immediately have a, a improvement of the blood pressure uh, and the hemodynamic parameters with less and less requirement of inotropic agents. Uh, we can also do preoperative embolization of vascular tumors who are posted for surgery and that, uh, that will pave way for a bloodless uh, 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 loss, blood uh, 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 surgery, which is free of blood loss. And uh, tumors like zonal nasal angiofibromas, spinal hemangiomas, aneurysmal bones, soft tissue hemangiomas, and paragangliomas, which are very vascular, can benefit from this treatment. Uh, one of the rare conditions that we have treated is a congenital portosystemic shunt, which is a communication between the portal and the systemic circulations in uh, childhood. And this shunt actually causes various complications like increasing the uh, load to the right heart and cause pulmonary hypertension because of the direct shunt and also result in a peculiar complications, which is uh, refractory hypoglycemia due to the portal uh, uh, insulin present in the portal circulation directly reaching the systemic circulation without undergoing the hepatic metabolism. 
so because of these the children can present with uh, complications we have a we had a 70 old neonate who presented with a to a piku with uh, recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia needing continuous dextrose infusion child also had respiratory distress on day 7 and was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension we can see that there is a shunt between the left portal vein and the left hepatic vein which is better visualized on this coronal oblique projection so what we did was we uh, accessed the internal jugular vein on the right side we took a catheter and under ultrasound guidance we could actually see the shunt and we could cannulate the shunt with the help of an ultrasound guidance because uh, the fluoroscopy did not show exactly the uh, level of the shunt or the shunt, the point where it opens into so under ultrasound guidance we entered the shunt and we placed an embolizing agent called vascular plug which is nothing but a compact nitinol mesh which promotes thrombosis so after that the child had a, a, a rapid recovery of hypoglycemia and also is doing well in the uh, uh, follow up period uh, pulmonary avms are lesions which are direct communications between the peripheral pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein leading on to absence of oxygenation and absence of filtration of blood from the uh, right side of the heart to the left side of the heart so that uh, because of that the children can have hypoxia and effort intolerance and also paradoxical embolism because of absence of filtration leading on to strokes and cerebral abscesses which are devastating complications so the current guidelines are recommend to treat all pavms regardless of size previously it was mentioned as 3 mm but now they recommend treating all pavms because of the risk of paradoxical embolism because that can be devastating sometimes the uh, treatment that we do is uh, vascular plug embolization because these are a large fistula between the uh, enlarged pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins directly and vascular plugs are actually excellent devices which are mechanical agents which can stay there where we deploy it so here we uh, oversize it by around 50% of the feeding artery and once we deploy it the thrombosis starts and uh, by the next day if you see this is an angiogram performed the next day we see that the fistula is totally obliterated the child become the uh, saturation improves drastically in the over the following days and uh, child doesn't have any more symptoms of exercise intolerance uh, the some of the other procedures that we do are placements of central lines in the form of a pick line which is a peripherally inserted central venous catheter used for chemotherapy in various childhood malignancies and this is a, a tunneled dialysis catheter which we place for hemodialysis in uh, chronic kidney disease patients uh, some uh, we we have also placed in children with chronic kidney disease we have specific sizes and uh, lengths that are suitable for children and these are very minimally invasive procedures which we can do bedside and confirm with a fluoroscopy uh, 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 in the dsa suit so in a nutshell to finish uh, intervention radiologists perform complex procedures through small pinholes and they are minimally invasive leading on to less and less morbidity compared to traditional surgical procedures and uh, that leads on to a rapid recovery of the patient so we treat wide range of diseases from head to toe uh, in various parts of the body apart from the heart of course and uh, whenever you have an vascular emergency please remember do call an intervention radiologist who uh, is in your place and uh, they'll help help you out in managing that vascular emergency so uh, i would like to thank my mentors uh, dr mathi cherin and dr pankaj mehta who have taught a uh, 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 generation of intervention radiologists from kmch and uh, i would like to thank our postgraduates both current and former for helping us prepare these slides and uh, uh, last but not the least the pediatricians and intensive intensivists who have uh, referred the patients at the right time Uh, to our uh, department and uh, got the procedures done at the right time to have the right therapeutic effect uh, we also would like to thank the cath lab staff who have supported us a lot and also the anesthetists who have there whenever we wanted for a pediatric case thank you uh, it's very good as usual uh, any questions so what is the percentage of failure in your attempts sir we seldom fail sir we actually have a, a good imaging guidance uh, to our help we have a biplane dsa lab in our hospital uh, actually in coimbatore there are six biplane labs including the cmch uh, medical college hospital 
so we have uh, the help of uh, 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 very uh, vastly developed technology to guide us actually perform this intervention so seldom we fail in this intervention sir that's fine excellent yes sir actually kamdur has a greatest density of uh, cath labs in india not even in chennai or mumbai have these many biplane cath labs very good very good if uh, no doubt uh, we can move to the next lecture uh, this is ram kumar my friend he is actually a nuclear medicine consultant so it's so new to radiologist also and uh, we, we want to learn from ram kumar uh, when we need a nuclear medicine uh, imaging to help the child uh, ram kumar over to you yeah uh, i am not able to share my screen sir i think you have disabled it hello just hold on for a few minutes uh -huh. just once yeah please try now yeah sir shall i proceed sir uh, yes ram kumar we can hear you And thank you, Dr. Rajendran sir and Dr. Kannan sir and the Society of Indian uh, Indian Society of Pediatrics for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak something about nuclear medicine. And my today's talk is uh, immediately uh, utility of uh, nuclear medicine and pediatrics. Uh, immediately is actually a team from uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. because most of the pediatricians who we actually have discussions with they fear about the radiation dose given to the patients especially the pediatric patients so what we want to convey through this image gently theme is that uh, the radiation used in nuclear medicine is very minimal and uh, the pediatric nuclear medicine dose is even too minimal so the radiation used in nuclear medicine is completely safe and uh, pediatric patients can undergo the nuclear medicine procedures whenever in need uh the last uh, two lines of the slide just say, just say, says about the quantum of radiation a human normally receives uh, natural background radiation uh, also a human receives radiation from multiple sources and the radiation we use in nuclear medicine is just equal to the radiation a human receives from natural background when he undergoes 10 delhi to kambatur round trip flights now uh, pediatric nuclear medicine the relationship between pediatrics and nuclear medicine started as early as 1940s when the first nuclear medicine study was done on a pediatric patient for suspicion of congenital hypothyroidism with dr jim conway and now pediatric uh, nuclear medicine uh, which has started only for thyroid disorders have now progressed to have a niche, having a niche role in uh, pediatric urology pediatric nephrology pediatric uh, gastroenterology endocrinology infection diseases and diagnostic and therapeutic oncology the question why nuclear medicine nuclear medicine people we basically answer the diagnostic puzzles caused by the break in physiology of the system uh, every human function is a physiology and whenever there is a break in physiology we nuclear medicine physicians do have a role in diagnosing it we see the real time abnormalities in the physiology and the most common question the diagnostic or clinical question which is given to us by the pediatricians or any practicing physician is when to intervene so nuclear medicine uh, in most situations give, uh, give the answers to practicing pediatricians or physicians whether this is the right time to intervene in the patient or not uh, congenital hypothyroidism for nuclear medicine people thyroid and iodine are the bread and butter and so i, I am starting the presentation with congenital hypothyroidism so congenital hypothyroidism is a very serious condition and if not treated at a uh, right time it may lead to uh, serious uh, developmental and mental delay in the patients so when uh, the need of nuclear medicine imaging and the first investigation in a patient with suspicion of congenital hypothyroidism is the measurement of tsh and it is usually measured in the first week of life as early as third day and uh, the ideal time for nuclear medicine imaging is 
before the thyroxine replacement therapy and uh, right uh, timely replacement of thyroxine is very essential so that the patient can have a normal uh, developmental milestones so where do nuclear medicine imaging actually play a role in uh, congenital hypothyroidism european society of pediatric endocrinology actually recommends both uh, the ultrasound neck and thyroid scintigraphy during the initial diagnosis apart from uh, uh, giving the structural information uh, nuclear medicine scintigraphy can also give about uh, dishormonogenesis that is even if the gland is present intact if the gland is having some biochemical biochemical and enzymal abnormalities nuclear medicine studies can also say about it so this is a, a image of a thyroid scintigraphy so thyroid scintigraphy we basically use a tracer called as technician 99 or iodine 131 this is very similar to the elemental iodine which is actually very necessary which is necessary for the developmental and development and function of uh, thyroid gland the image shown in the slide is of a normal thyroid gland we can see normal thyroid gland in a baby so uh, this slide tells about the spectrum of uh, congenital hypothyroidism if you see this is the normal uh, thyroid gland which is usually seen in thyroid scintigraphy and if you see this is the patient of congenital a genesis of thyroid gland you don't see the thyroid gland in usual location and this is the second case this is also a case of congenital hypothyroidism if you see you can only see one half of the gland is well visualized and the right half of the gland is not visualized this is a case of uh, congenital hemigenesis and third slide this is a case of uh, sublingual ectopic thyroid this is the supraglandular and thyroid is usually present in the supraglandular but in this case the patient is having an elevated tsh and the ultrasound is suggestive of absence of thyroid gland so when we did the thyroid scintigraphy we localized the thyroid gland that is we, we found an ectopic thyroid gland in the sublingual region and this image this is an image of thyroid dishormonogenesis demonstrated by petcore test i'll tell you about that uh, a certain fraction of patients they will be having a structurally intact thyroid gland so ultrasound neck will be suggestive of presence of thyroid gland but the patient's biochemical parameters that is tsh will be very high so you know usually those cases one of the reasons is thyroid dishormonogenesis that is congenital enzyme deficiency usually due to peroxidase enzyme deficiency so what happens in this case is the iodine or the uh, technetium we use in the scan is usually taken up by the scan taken up by the thyroid gland but in order to check the enzymatic status we employ a agent known as perchlorate so this perchlorate what happens is this perchlorate competitively uh, inhibits and displaces the iodine gland okay iodine which is not organified so if the patient is not having an organification defect this uh, iodine the thyroid gland will be normal even in the post perchlorate test too but if the patient is having an organification defect then we will be having a, a reduced uptake in the post perchlorate discharge test so by this way we can differentiate between uh, a structurally present structurally intact thyroid gland if the patient is having some dishormonogenesis features coming to neonatal cholestasis syndrome so neonatal cholestasis is another a complex uh, diagnosis and one of the uh, etiological causes of neonatal cholestasis is extra hepatic obstruction so an extra hepatic obstruction actually nuclear medicine plays a very important role uh, rather i will say a complementary role <clears throat> so the need for hepatobiliary scintigraphy uh, usually arises to differentiate between total and partial cholestasis the tracer we use in hepatobiliary scintigraphy is known as uh, mebrofenin uh, mebrofenin is nothing but an analog of bile so wherever bile goes mebrofenin will follow the same pattern so we can easily see the bile formation pathway and excretion pathway <coughs> so why uh, the need for nuclear medicine imaging in extra hepatic biliary atresia prompt identification is necessary in extra hepatic biliary atresia because uh, the surgical success rate of uh, kasai kasai surgery actually comes down when it is done later 
So in order to intervene uh, early, we need a nuclear medicine study to rule out extrahepatic biliary atresia. So what I'm showing here is a normal HIDA scan. We have injected uh, the tracer known as mebrofenin. As I said earlier, mebrofenin will follow the same path as bile. So we can see the tracer in uh, liver. We can see the tracer in gallbladder. And after some time, we can see the tracer in intestines. So this means uh, the pathway is clear. There is no atresia of the biliary apparatus. But whereas what happens in uh, uh, extrahepatic biliary atresia is, we can see the tracer in liver. We can see the tracer in bladder. But we don't see the tracer in intestine. That means that is an obstruction. The bad so this is a pre-surgical HIDA scan and uh, the image on your left is the post-surgical HIDA scan. So this patient underwent Kasai's procedure and after successful Kasai procedure, we, uh, the patient underwent a HIDA scan again. The difference is you can see the intestinal activity after Kasai's procedure. So this explains the success of the surgery. And uh, a role of pediatricians before sending a patient to HIDA scan. So since uh, this is the this is about neonatal cholestasis, the usual pathology involved in neonatal cholestasis is the biliary ducts will be usually inflamed. So if a patient is coming with a highly inflammatory biliary ducts, the tracer we inject actually, even if the pathway is clear without any atresia, sometimes we do face a difficulty when the tracer actually is not getting excreted from the liver. This is mainly due to the inflammatory bile ducts. So in order to reduce the bile ducts and in order to induce the enzymes in liver, we recommend uh, the we recommend inducing the patients with three drugs before the patient is being sent for HIDA scan. That is pinovarbitone, 5 mg per kg per day for 5 days. And then is beta methasone or prednisolone, 2.2 mg per kg per day for 5 days. This is mainly to uh, reduce the inflammation in the ducts. And third is UDCA, that is 40 mg per kg per day for 3 to 5 days. The first drug, phenobarbitone, is mainly used as an enzyme inducer so that to increase the specificity of the uh, diagnostic modality. <clears throat> gastroesophageal reflex. Gastroesophageal reflex is actually a very rare diagnosis in children, but whenever a child is showing some uh, failure to thrive or uh, recurrent pneumonia or intermittent wheezing or apneic events, then the pediatrician has to think about gastroesophageal reflex. So what we do in gastro, what we do for gastroesophageal reflex is we use a tracer called technetium. We mix that in milk and feed it to the baby. Okay, and once the tracer with the milk reaches the stomach, we focus our uh, camera over the baby and we see the reflex coming from stomach to esophagus uh, on live time. So uh, this is the image. This is how the images actually look. The bigger part, uh, what we see is actually the tracer with the milk in the stomach. It is closely related to anemia and the tracer. This linear uptake is the reflex coming from stomach to the esophagus. So this is how we actually demonstrate gastroesophageal reflex by nuclear medicine. This is another image. In this image, I think you can see clearly, you can see a smaller dot compared to the bigger dot, superior to the images. So this is actually the gastroesophageal reflex. So this is actually a early uh, gastroesophageal, gastroesophageal reflex. In nuclear medicine, we usually quantify the gastroesophageal reflex, whether it is uh, high-grade reflex or low-grade reflex, depending upon the height the which uh, the reflexing material reaches. This is uh, another important uh, slide. This is actually a patient of gastroesophageal reflex who presented with pneumonia. So the doctor thought of uh, aspiration uh, due to gastroesophageal reflex. We can also demonstrate the aspiration from gastroesophageal reflex in nuclear medicine study. This is actually the tracer which has reflexed from the stomach and has gone to the patient's lung, which we are demonstrating in nuclear medicine study. So this is a, a pulmonary aspiration as a result of gastroesophageal reflex. Meckel's diverticulum. So Meckel's diverticulum is one of the um, common causes of uh, bleeding in children. Um, babies usually present with rectal bleeding. Found in about 2% of population and majority are asymptomatic. Most common presentation is blood per rectum. 
And here we use the basic nuclear medicine agent that is 19 nm per decanate. The idea behind using a nuclear medicine study in Meckel's diverticulum is at Meckel's diverticulum is nothing but an ectopic gastric mucosa. So the work hearts of nuclear medicine is technetium M, uh, the technetium 99M, which is usually taken up by the gastric mucosa. So the catch here is both uh, the ectopic gastric mucosa, the Meckel's diverticulum and the stomach will be showing the uptake in same intensity. And that is how we actually locate the Meckel's diverticulum. So this is an image showing the Meckel's diverticulum. So the tracer we usually inject goes into the stomach. And if you see a focal spot here, you can see a focal spot here. Both the regions contain ectopic gastric mucosa. So both the regions will be taking up the uh, uh, technique we injected. So this is a very highly specific study. By this way, we can uh, diagnose the site of Meckel's diverticulum and guide the doctor. She is a disorder. So nuclear medicine plays a very important role in uh, delineation of epileptic uh, echogenic zone in patients with intractable seizures. So patients usually who present with intractable seizures do have an option of surgery. Uh, many patients, if they undergo surgery and if they get their epileptogenic zone removed, they may lead a normal life. And nuclear medicine plays a very important role in it. <clears throat> and what parameters uh, do we see in uh, uh, delineating the epileptogenic zone? We basically see two parameters. One is brain perfusion, other one is brain glucose metabolism. As we all know, an epileptogenic zone will have an increased perfusion. And that is uh, identified by uh, technetium labeled ECD. And at the same time, an epileptogenic zone uh, will be having a decreased glucose metabolism. That is, uh, this increased perfusion is usually seen at the time of epilepsy that we call as ictal spect scan. And this decreased glucose metabolism, we usually see once the patient is not seizing or it is seen in the interval period. So this scan, we call it as Interictal PET. So in interictal PET CT, we will be having the glucose metabolism. In ictal PET CT, we will be having increased brain perfusion. So this is the one. Increased perfusion during seizures, decreased to metabolism between seizures. So this is known as interictal PET and this is known as ictal PET. So nuclear medicine uses this mismatch, mismatch pathology to identify the seizure focus. And apart from that, uh, uh, one of the recent advancements we have in nuclear medicine is uh, two softwares, which we name as Syscom and Syscos. The Syscom software, we what basically do is we take an uh, ictal spec, we take an interictal spec, and if the patient's MRI is available with structural abnormality, we co-register the spec finding to the MRI. This is known as Syscom. So by this way, we can easily find out the epileptogenic zone with more diagnostic accuracy. The next software is Syscos. This is just nothing but uh, taking two images, that is ictal spec, uh, taking a spec scan uh, one, while the patient is seizing, then taking an interictal spec, that is taking a spec, sense, spec scan when the patient is not seizing, then fusing both the images and then finding out the exact difference in blood supply. So this is one of the Syscom images. This patient has a known case of uh, left temporal lobe epilepsy. So the third row image is an MRI. And the second row image is the uh, increased perfusion, which is co-registered to, to, co to the MRI. So there is some problem with my stylus. So I couldn't, uh, I can't, I can't mark the images. So the third row is an MRI image. And the second row is an image which is showing uh, increased perfusion. So you can see the colored part in the left temporal row region. So that is actually showing the increased blood supply, which is co-registered to the MRI, delineating the epileptogenic zone. And this is a PET-CT image. Uh, you can see the uh, round in the middle image, a blue round. It is actually showing uh, decreased glucose metabolism 
when compared to the other side. So this decreased glucose metabolism is actually significant of the ecleptogenic zone. This is another uh, syscom image. Now coming to uh, pediatric uh, nephrourology. Nuclear medicine plays a very important role in uh, pediatric nephrourology. Uh, the clinical problems can be divided into three basic headings. One is antenatal hydronephrosis, the next, uh, next is reflux disorders, and third is UTI and pyelonephritis. So antenatal hydronephrosis. So antenatal hydronephrosis can be due to transient physiological dilatation, transient urine flow abnormalities, which may be due to delayed maturation of the urinary tract or structural disorders like Kuhn belly syndrome. And it may it may can also be due to permanent urine flow abnormalities. The point here is most of the antenatal hydronephrosis results on its own, but 35% of the patients, according to various estimates with the antenatal hydronephrosis, progress to postnatal hydronephrosis. The question here is when to intervene and how to manage the patients. So management actually requires help from nuclear medicine department. So two type of the patients, the 35 percentage of postnatal hydronephrosis patients can be classified into two or three types based on their management protocol. One is conservative management. Second is just to relieve the urinary flow tract abnormality, just inserting a stent or something like that. And third is going for a definitive uh, uh, procedure called pyeloplasty. So how nuclear medicine helps in determining which patient should undergo a immediate intervention. So the parameters we basically give in nuclear medicine is renal parenchymal transit time, split function, quantification of obstruction, evidence of direct reflex, indirect reflex, and scars. So what is renal parenchymal transit time? So this is a model uh, nuclear medicine. This is a model uh, renogram. We basically use two tracers. One is DTPA. This is this actually maps the glomerular filtration physiology, that is urine formation. The other tracer what we use is EC. This actually mimics the tubular secretion physiology. So these two tracers are used whether to see the patient has got an obstruction or not. So I have told you uh, these parameters can be seen from the uh, nuclear medicine study. What is renal parenchymal transit time? So this is So, the time in which the tracer travels from cortex, that is from parenchyma, to the collecting system is known as renal parenchymal transit time. So, this renal parenchymal transit time is an important marker of the parenchymal function. If the renal parenchymal transit time is normal, that says the kidney has not uh, gone into a, the kidney is still intact. Uh, the parenchyma is still intact, the parenchyma is not damaged. Next is split function. Usually, the normal split function is 45 to 55 percent. That is, both the kidneys should contribute equally to the overall renal function. That is known as split function. If one kidney is having an antenatal hydronephrosis and that kidney is not taken care of and that kidney starts uh, increasing its uh, hydronephrosis, it will contribute uh, lesser than the other kidney. So, in that case, we'll be having a difference in split renal function. So, that is one point to intervene. Third is quantification of obstruction. So, this is basically how we uh, uh, quantify the obstruction. We basically quantify uh, hydronephrosis into uh, complete obstruction, partial obstruction, and uh, non obstructive pooling. So, non obstructive pooling is so there won't be any obstruction, but the tracer drainage will be very slow. This may be due to physiological uh, uh, effects or due to hydration status. Next is complete obstruction and partial obstruction. So complete obstruction is we usually take 24 images to quantify the obstruction. If the tracer we injected has not come out of the kidneys even after 24 hours, that is known as complete obstruction. So complete obstruction in most cases, uh, the kidney function will start deteriorating after some time. So most uh, pediatric neurosurgeons, if they feel the patient is having a complete obstruction and if the parenchymal transit time is not normal, they go for immediate pyeloplasty. Next is partial obstruction. Partial obstruction is the kidneys will not excrete the tracer till four hours, but the kidneys will start excreting the tracer after four hours. This is some kind of stasis. So in these cases, the pediatric nephrourologist will feel 
the kidney showing some partial obstruction pattern and the renal parenchymal transit time is normal, they will adopt a wait and watch approach. So this is how we quantify the obstruction. So this is a case of complete obstruction. If you see, uh, this is the left, left kidney actually. Uh, we uh, take the images from posterior side. So this is the left kidney and this is the right kidney. From the first images, we are not seeing an equal contribution from both the kidneys. We can see the tracer in the right kidney, but we, we don't actually see the tracer in the left kidney. The, kidney. the left kidney is starting to show some minimal amount of tracer. At the end of the study, we actually don't see any tracer in the right kidney. That is, the tracer, whatever is present in the right kidney is actually excreted, but the tracer is still present in the left kidney. This means, this, uh, actually this is a 24 hours image. So, the, kidney, the tracer is present in the left kidney even after 24 hours. This means that this patient is having a complete obstruction. It's coming to uh, parenchymal transit time. We don't get to see the pelvis even after 20 minutes. Okay. The usual marker to find out the renal parenchymal transit time is the time at which the tracer appears in the pelvis. In this case, the tracer is not seen in the pelvis even after 20 minutes. So this is a definite case of a kidney with a delayed intrarenal parenchymal, parenchymal transit time, signifying the parenchymal damage the kidney has uh, occurred. This is one example of how nuclear medicine studies can be used to see the uh, response assessment. This is a case of uh, right kidney uh, PUJ obstruction. So this is a pre-pyloplasty image. The kidney is not excreting the tracer at the end of the study. This is a case of PUJ obstruction. I think uh, this image will give you a better. If you see the first image, you don't see the tracer in the first image. It's a hemopenic image. That means the tracer is not actually taken up by the right kidney. If you see the first image here, you can see the kidney taking up the tracer. So that means. Uh, uh, the patient has undergone a pyeloplasty and the kidney has started taking up the tracer. Usually after pyeloplasty, the system takes at least six months to one year to normalize the flow in the obstructed PUJ. UTI in children. UTI is one of the common problems pediatricians encounter in children. But uh, when do we need to do nuclear medicine imaging in UTI? Not all patients who, under, who have an episode of UTI need nuclear medicine imaging. There are certain red flag signs. If the patient is having those red flag signs. Nuclear medicine imaging can be done, should be done. And those signs are poor urinary stream, palpable kidneys, uh, which is uh, suggestive of nephromagaly, atypical organism, high fever, septicemia, and failure to respond to antibiotic treatment within uh, 48 hours and recurrent UT. Actually, this is a summation of guidelines given by various associations. But in day-to-day -day practice, the only indication where we nuclear medicine uh, physicians advocate the use of nuclear medicine imaging is recurrent UTI. If the patient is having recurrent bouts of UTI, then uh, um, DMSA and reflux studies can be done. So as far as the protocol of uh, imaging for nuclear, uh, urinary tract infection patients is concerned, the first choice always remains the ultrasound. And next, DMSA and glucoheptanoid scan to see the damage the kidneys uh, has suffered, whether it is acute pyelonephritis, whether it is chronic pyelonephritis, uh, or actually the kidneys are whether scarred due to uh, multiple episodes of UTI. And next is DRCG. DRCG is a modality in nuclear medicine where we can see the reflux. Uh, two types of uh, DRCG. For want of time, I'm skipping the slide. So uh, this is a normal DRCG. DRCG is direct radionuclear histogram. That is, we can see the reflux. What we do is uh, we inject laser into the bladder, either the myocardial or through suprapubic method. And we ask the patient to void. So when the patient voids, we can see whether the we can see present of tracer from the bladder to the kidneys. If that is present, we can see the reflex. Uh, this is a positive uh, reflex study. The tracer is present in the bladder, and then when the baby starts to void, we can see the ascent of tracer from the bladder to the collecting system. So this is suggestive of reflex. Uh, this is a slide showing reflux both during the voiding phase and during the force void phase. The so one advantage in having a reflux study in nuclear medicine is we can uh, uh, we can see the reflux 
during the filling phase and the voiding phase and during the post void phase. This is a scarred kidney after reflex nephropathy. You can see the scarred uh, right-sided kidney. This is a DMSA scan. This is a DRCG scan showing bilateral VUR. Now coming to the question, uh, DRCG or MCU? If the baby is a male child, then the diagnose, the first modality of choice is MCU because we need to rule out the anatomical abnormality. So MCU always remains the first choice. When it is a female child, DRCG provides the same benefits as the MCU with a lesser radiation dose. Renal cortical scintigraphy. This renal cortical scintigraphy is basically to say whether the kidneys are scarred, whether the kidneys are showing some acute phyllonephritis or chronic phyllonephritis changes. The trace that we use here is uh, DMSA. This DMSA usually goes and gets attached to the proximal convoluted tubules. And whenever there is an acute pyelonephritis change, uh, acute pyelonephritis results in edema. So whenever there is edema, the tracer distribution in that particular spot will be reduced. So this is the case of acute pyelonephritis. You can see a normal right kidney. There is a kidney's continuous membrane reduced trace So this means the kidney is edematic due to acute pyelonephritis. So we need to actually go the tracer here. This is an acute pyelonephritis change. And this is a chronic pyelonephritis change. If you, see, if you can see, in this case, it is continuous maintained. Whereas, in this case, even the kidney is lost. This means the kidney has undergone some chronic pyelonephritis changes and the kidney is actually scarred. This is a completely scarred kidney after result of multiple UTAs, multiple unchecked UTAs. Uh, we can see a minimum stand of renal parenchyma, nothing else is seen. So, this is a completely scarred kidney. Uh, last few slides. Uh, this is a rare case, testicular torsion. So, what happens in testicular torsion is testis is a wonder organ because uh, testis is supplied by a different artery and the fascia surrounding testis is supplied by a different artery. Testis is usually supplied by testicular arteries and the fascia surrounding the testis that is supplied by pudendal artery. So what happens is whenever the patient goes for a testicular torsion and the patient comes to nuclear medicine study to confirm the diagnosis. Basically, patients come to nuclear medicine to confirm the diagnosis. What we see in testicular torsion is we inject the tracer, we see the flow in iliac arteries, but we actually don't get to see the testis. See, we see a photopenic area here, we see the normal testis here. So the testis has gone for a torsion, but at the same time, due to this testicular torsion, the overlying dartos muscle will be having some hyperemia, and this hyperemia can be seen in this testicular in this uh, testicular scintigraphy due to the different blood supply. So this is a classical case of testicular torsion, which can be diagnosed and which can be confirmed in nuclear medicine. It is an emergency. Uh, PET CT actually, since uh, the time given to me was only twenty minutes, I couldn't cover the entire topic. Uh, I'll just highlight uh, what is the role of PET CT. PET CT basically these days are used for pediatric lymphomas, neuroblastomas, embryonic sarcomas, pyrexia of unknown origin, and tuberculosis. And uh, PET CT, in the sense, we used to stage the patients. We see we used PET CT for treatment response assessment and restaging and surveillance. Therapeutic nuclear medicine, once again, uh, this is the scope of the talk. Uh, I don't think uh, therapeutic nuclear medicine is actually fitting into the picture. We usually give iodine 131 therapy for pediatric thyroid carcinomas and iodine 131 MABG therapy for metastatic neuroblastomas and radio cyanobectomy with uh, yttrium 90 for hemophilic arthropathy. Just uh, last two slides, uh, these two actually are very good cases and uh, recently uh, we our nuclear medicine branch has shown some good promise in diagnosing these cases. One is autoimmune encephalitis, other one is Rasmussen encephalitis. I particularly posted this image because the treating physician is uh, among us in the panel, Dr. Rajendran sir. Uh, this is Dr. Rajendran sir's case. Uh, the baby was a six-year-old uh, male child and he had continuous fever and the baby slowly progressed to have some uh, loss of cognition, uh, loss of mentation and started having some seizures and all. But they couldn't arrive at a diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Rajendran, Professor Rajendran discussed with us about the possibility of an autoimmune encephalitis. He told that we are doing some adult cases. So this was the first pediatric autoimmune encephalitis done, on, done it at our hospital. So what happens in autoimmune encephalitis is the subcortical areas of the brain, uh, they are actually hypermetabolic due to some uh, immune reactions. 
and those hypermetabolic areas are actually shown in the film. The usual regions involved are mesial temporal lobe, parahypocampal para region, hippocampal region, amygdala, and thalamus. This red region signifies increased metabolism in these areas. So we did a scan and we told Dr. Rajendran saying that uh, the patient is showing some increased areas of hypermetabolism. And this could be a very well a case of a pediatric autumn encephalitis. And we suggested him to go for some immunosuppressive agents. The first comment, uh, the Dr. Rajendran agreed and he went for intravenous immunoglobulin. And he called us the next day and told that the patient has shown some tremendous response after a single dose of intravenous immuno, uh, immunoglobulin. So why uh, I want to say is, uh, in those cases of diagnostic conundrum, PET-CT can actually help. So the physicians, uh, after this uh, post-COVID uh, pandemic era, if they think of any autoimmune encephalitis, they can ask for a PET-CT, brain PET-CT. And this is a last image. Uh, this is once again uh, the utility of PET-CT after post-COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is an image of a patient who is having some post-COVID-19 related myocarditis in actually a setup of post-COVID multisystem inflammatory syndrome. So the baby had a post-COVID multisystem inflammatory syndrome and uh, uh, he had some cardiac symptoms and no diagnosis, no modality helped. And that this is actually an image from uh, PGA Chandigarh. Uh, then as a last effort, they went for PET-CT. So FDG PET-CT after having all this heart suppression measures and physiological uptake suppression, the image showed some uptake in the lateral wall and inferior wall of the patient. So this actually signified uh, uh, myocarditis due to COVID-19. The same thing happened. The patient was put on immunosuppressants. The patient showed some good response uh, after the course of immunosuppressants. So thank you. And uh, if uh, someone have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Uh, they ask about cost, Ram. Nuclear scans cost. One minute, sir. Can you see me, sir? I can't see anyone. No, in chat box, I read for you. They, they ask okay. about the cost. Sir, uh, <clears throat> for, uh, if the pet CT is only for brain, then we do it for 8,000 in games each. And uh, if it is for whole body, the maximum price we have is 17,500 and poor patients are, uh, if you want, if they just want a regional pet CT, then we do for 13,000, sir. That is a minimum cost. I think uh, ours is the cheapest pet CT in Coimbatore. Uh, any other questions? If uh, no questions for renal scan, sir, for renal scan, nuclear renal scan. How renal much? scan, sir. The cost for uh, it is uh, 4,500, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If uh, uh, no questions, uh, we will move to next speaker. Uh, me or Pudyan won't agree with the uh, last image. The myocarditis, he can pick it up with the cardiac MR, I believe. <laughs> the Pudyavan is actually... Uh, then I always uh, maintain uh, pet CT is a complementary modality, not a computing modality. <laughs> so, uh, uh, he finished a fellowship in cardiac imaging in uh, Narayana Gridalaya. So, he did uh, all cardiac work in KMCH, uh, congenital everything. He is one doing largest cardiac MR in Tamil Nadu, I believe. So he is doing a lot of cases in cardiac MR and congenital heart disease also. He has the reference all over India to report congenital heart disease. Uh, he interested to show some very difficult cases. I told uh, just a segmental approach enough for us. Over to you, Pudhyavad. You are agree with uh, myocarditis, Pudhyavad. Uh, yeah, uh, I would have liked to know if that patient had undergone a cardiac MR and whether cardiac MR showed anything. Uh, okay, so coming to uh, today's uh, topic, um, congenital heart disease, um, 
uh, is one of the most common birth defects that we encounter in uh, children. Um, and uh, the, the pickup of these uh, birth defects is also increasing in recent times because of the very intensive antenatal screening programs uh, that are available uh, right now. So what I will do today is I will uh, take you all uh, through a segmental approach um, to both imaging as well as interpretation of congenital heart diseases. So the objectives of this talk uh, will be um, to see the imaging modalities that are available to uh, look at congenital heart diseases, the pros and cons of each modality, and how to approach imaging in congenital heart diseases. Uh, there are a plethora of choices that are available for, uh, uh, for the clinicians uh, as far as congenital heart disease is considered, uh, starting from transthoracic echocardiography, uh, CT, uh, cardiac MR, uh, transesophageal echocardiography, and catheter angiography. Uh, Dr. Santosh uh, spoke about uh, catheter angiography, so I will stick to the diagnostic imaging modalities. Um, coming to the transthoracic echography, so transthoracic echo is the first line choice for pediatric congenital heart diseases. No two ways about it. It uses ultrasound energy to produce image. So since it uses ultrasound energy, there is no ionizing radiation. Uh, so it can be repeated serially and it has the best spatial and a good temporal resolution. Coming to the pros and cons of an echocardiography. So as I told, there is no ionizing radiation. You can get both anatomic data as well as functional data with a transthoracic echo. Uh, it is cheap, it is easily accessible, and it is also ideal for serial follow-up. You can just repeat it as number of times you want. The cons of a transthoracic echocardiography is that it has poor echo window. So especially in older children and adults, because the entire, because of the window issues, we, we won't be able to assess the entire cardiac structures and the extra cardiac structures. So it is very poor for extra cardiac, uh, visualizing extra cardiac structures. And also echocardiography is also an operator dependent modality. Coming to CT angiography. So uh, it helps us in a comprehensive evaluation of pediatric as well as adult congenital heart diseases. Uh, CT angiography uses X-ray energy to uh, produce images. So because X-ray is an ionizing radiation, uh, there, will, uh, there is a risk of radiation, especially in children. However, CT angiography uh, provides us with a better spatial resolution in the range of around 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters. Um, coming to the pros and cons of CT angiography, um, the pros are that it provides a 3D data set because of a very good spatial resolution and uh, the imaging time for a CT angio is also very short. It hardly takes a few minutes to complete a comp uh, CT angiography for a infant. Uh, there are no window limitations. Uh, any body size can be imaged. And the, we can also use a larger FOV covering the entire chest and also the abdomen if it is necessary. So in a lot of congenital heart, suspected congenital heart diseases, there are associated abnormalities in the abdomen. So CT will be very helpful in covering, the, covering those things also. The cons of a CT angiography this first thing is this ionizing radiation. And there is a need for sedation or GA. Though with the advent of the newer, faster CT scanners, general anesthesia is not needed nowadays. We never use general anesthesia for CT angiography. We only use a, uh, IV sedation for doing our CT angiography studies. Uh, the other con is that it provides limited functional data. Coming to cardiac MRI, so like a CT angiography, this is also very helpful in giving a comprehensive evaluation of both pediatric and adult congenital heart diseases. And cardiac MRI uses the magnetic resonance properties of the protons that are present in our body to form images. So there is no risk of any ionizing radiation and cardiac MRI can also produce both anatomic as well as functional data. However, there is the cardiac MRI has a poor spatial resolution. Uh, these slices are thick with four to six millimeter in thickness. However, the temporal resolution is much better. Coming to the pros and cons, as I told, there is no ionizing radiation for cardiac MRI. It provides both anatomical as well as functional data. There are no window limitations and a larger FOV can be used for larger children and also in adults. The cons is that um, currently 
most of the cardiac MR sequences are 2D sequences. So you have a, a low spatial resolution in these sequences and cardiac MR takes a long time. So uh, especially in congenital heart diseases, it takes a minimum of around 30 to 40 minutes to do a study. So the, uh, um, the need for general anesthesia or a deep IV sedation is mandatory while we are doing a cardiac MR. So coming to classifying congenital heart diseases, there are various ways of classifying congenital heart diseases. You can classify it based on the direction of shunt, whether it is a left to right or a right to left shunt, uh, based on the clinical parameters, whether clinically the patient has cyanosis or no cyanosis, whether the defects are intracardiac or extracardiac. And also there are a lot of complex congenital heart diseases with a mixture of shunts in a single patient. Uh, this is, uh, um, more with uh, named syndromes and heterotaxis where there is a lot of complex congenital heart diseases. So there is a real need for a simpler approach to enumerate all the anomalies uh, without complex jargon and without the risk of missing or overlooking a certain organs. So what we need is an universally acceptable template that is easily recognizable by the physicians, cardiologists and surgeons all alike. So coming to the segmental approach, the segmental approach to congenital heart diseases was first put forth by uh, Van Prague in 1972. Uh, it is nothing but a flexible and easy to understand approach to congenital heart diseases. And it is applicable to any imaging modality. It is not fixed for MR or CT. It can be used for any imaging modality. So in the segmental approach for congenital heart diseases, uh, assessing a congenital heart disease is divided into three distinct segments. The first is the visceroatrial situs, second is the ventricular loop, and third is the conotruncal relation. So these are the three distinct segments which we will be seeing. And followed by this, then we look at the atrioventricular connection, ventriculoarterial connection, and other associated abnormalities. I will just take you through one by one. Coming to the visceroatrial situs. So what is visceroatrial situs? So it is the relationship between the heart, that is the atria, and the visceral organs. So based on the visceroatrial situs, a patient can be either situs solitus, which is normal, situs inversus, or situs ambiguous. So this visceroatrial situs is based on the atrial, pulmonary, and abdominal visceral relations. So coming to the atrial relation, so whenever we are seeing a congenital heart disease, the cardiac chambers are named after their morphology. Just because an atrium is on the right side, of the chest and an atrium is on the left side of the chest doesn't make them right or the left atrium. So we have to look for the morphological right and the morphological left atrium. And the atrial morphology is mainly based on the appendage morphology and the venoatrial situs. So the right atrial appendage is a broad and short appendage, whereas the left atrial appendage is a narrow and long one. And the venoatrial situs is that the suprahepatic IVC almost always drains into the right atrium. So what, uh, what, whichever chamber the suprahepatic IVC is draining into, that is more likely to be the right atrium, whether it is on the right side or the left side of the chest. Coming to the pulmonary situs, so uh, the right lung is a trilobed lung, whereas the right uh, upper lobar bronchus is aparterial, meaning that the right upper lobar bronchus passes above the right pulmonary artery. Whereas the left lung is a bilobed lung and the left main bronchus passes below the left pulmonary artery. And we also look at the location of the abdominal viscera, mainly the liver, spleen, and stomach. So here is a uh, this is one, this is called situs solitus, which is the normal situs. So you have a trilobed right lung, bilobed left lung, the right bronchus is aparterial, the right atrium is on the right side liver is on the right side and spleen is on the left side. So this is situs solitus. Whereas the mirror image of situs solitus is the situs inversus, where the right lung or the trilobed lung is on the left side, the left lung or the bilobed lung is on the right side. And there is a mirror image of organs where liver is on the left side and spleen is on the right side. So the third entity is situs ambiguous, where it, the situs doesn't fit into either of the two conditions. So there are ambiguous can be of many type, many complex types. The most well-known and common types are right isomerism and left isomerism. In right isomerism, 
what happens is that there is bilateral trilobed lungs, bilateral epithelial bronchi, and there is absence of spleen with the liver taking the middle of the abdomen. Whereas in left isomerism, there is bilateral bilobed lungs, bilateral hyperterial bronchus, and there is absence of spleen, but the spleen is replaced by multiple spleen and cooling. There are other associated malformations where TAPVC is more commonly associated with right isomerism. TAPVC is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and an interrupted IVC is more commonly associated with left isomerism. So when we talk about visceroatrial situs, we will also talk about cardiac orientation and position. So the cardiac orientation is independent of the visceroatrial situs. So whatever be the situs, whether it is solitus or inversus or ambiguous, the cardiac orientation is independent of it. So based on the base to apex axis of the heart, the ca cardiac orientation can be levocardia, where the apex is towards the left side, uh, mesocardia, where the apex is towards the midline, and dextrocardia, where the apex is towards the right side. And based on cardiac position, we can again divide it into three types, lever position, dextro position, and meso position. So this is different because here the base to apex axis is still directed towards the left side, but the entire heart is moved from the left side to the middle or to the right side of the thoracic cavity. This mainly happens when there is an extra cardiac abnormality, likely and right lung aplasia, where there is a mediastinal shift to the right side, resulting in a dextro position, but the heart is still in a levocardia status. Coming to the second segment, which is the ventricular looping. So ventricular looping is nothing but the relationship between the right and the left ventricles. So we saw uh, visceroatrial situs, which was the relationship between the heart and the surrounding structures. Here, it is the relationship between the intracardiac structures, the right and the left ventricle. So the ventricular loop can be either a dextro loop or a D loop, uh, which is normal where the right ventricle is on the right side and the left ventricle is on the left side. Or it can be levo loop or L loop where the morphological right ventricle is on the left and morphological left ventricle is on the right. So like atria, just because a ventricle is on the right side doesn't make it a right ventricle. You will have to look for the morphological features of that particular ventricle. So what are the morphological features of a left ventricle? So it has thin trabeculae, whereas a morphological right ventricle has coarse trabeculae. The septal surface is smooth in a morphological left ventricle, whereas the septal surface contains the moderator band in right ventricle. There are two papillary muscles attached to the free wall in left ventricle, whereas there are three papillary muscles that are attached to the septum as well as the free wall in right ventricle. So here you can see, so this is a D loop arrangement where you can see this is the left ventricle with a smooth septal surface. This is the right ventricle. You can see the moderator band that is coming from the septum. Whereas this one is an L loop configuration where you can see that the moderator band and coarse trabeculations are seen in the ventricle that is placed on the left side. So this becomes the morphological right ventricle. Whereas the ventricle with the smooth septal surface is present on the right side, and this becomes the morphological left ventricle. Sometimes it is not so straightforward. It becomes really difficult to differentiate which is the morphological right and which is the morphological left ventricle on imaging. So in that cases, we follow something called as the loop rule, where the aortic valve is on the right side, then the ventricular looping is most probably a D loop. And when the aortic valve is on the left side, the ventricular looping is most probably L loop. Coming to the third segment, which is conotruncal relation. So conotruncal relation is nothing but the relationship between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So it also has three, four types. Solitus, which is the normal, where pulmonary annulus is present in anterior and to the left, whereas the aortic annulus is present posterior and to the right. So there are three other variations in chronotruncal relations, inverses, D transposition, and L transposition. So this is a, a diagram that shows the different uh, morphological abnormalities that can occur with chronotruncal relation. So this is the situs solitus or the normal, where the pulmonary artery is anterior and to the left, iota is posterior and to the right. In inverses, the anteroposterior relation of the iota and pulmonary arteries are maintained However, the aorta is on the left side. 
In transposition, the aorta happens to be on the anterior aspect. And if the pulmonary artery is on the left side, it is D transposition. And if the pulmonary artery is on the right side, it is L transposition. And apart from these four named uh, abnormalities, in this 360 degree circle, the aorta can aorta can, pulmonary relation can be anywhere among the 360 degree circle during the embryological rotation. So it can either be side to side or anteroposterior in complex congenital abnormalities. So this is an image which shows situs solitus. So this is the aorta, the left main coronary artery taking up the aorta, and this is the pulmonary artery which is placed anteriorly and to the left of the aorta. This is and situs. This is an inversus where the aorta is placed posterior to the end, uh, pulmonary artery, but on the left side. So this is a D transposition where aorta is placed anteriorly and to the right. And this is an L transposition where the aorta is placed anteriorly and to the left. So we have seen the three segmentations, visceroatrial situs, the ventricular looping and the conotruncal relation. So next, the next step will be to follow the flow of blood. So how does the blood flow through the body? So the venous blood comes from the IVC uh, uh, and the SVC goes into the right atrium, right ventricle and into the pulmonary arteries. And it goes into the pulmonary circulation, returns via the pulmonary veins into the left atria, left ventricle and into the systemic arteries. So what we do is we follow the blood and look for all these connections. So the first will be the systemic and pulmonary venous connections. Um, though the systemic and pulmonary venous connection doesn't contribute to the visceral situs status, uh, it, has an, it has important surgical implications to delineate where does the systemic and pulmonary veins drain into. So this is the venoatrial situs. We will have to look for the IVC and SVC drainage, whether it is draining into the right atrium or the left atrium. The pulmonary venous drainage which has to drain into the left atrium, we also look at the number and site of drainage. So if there are single SVC or two SVC, single IVC or two IVC, number of pulmonary veins, whether all the pulmonary veins are draining into the left atrium or some are going and draining into somewhere else, which becomes partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So the anomalous drainage can either be supracardiac above the level of the heart, cardiac, where it can directly drain into the coronary sinus or into the right atria directly or infracardiac, where it can drain into the systemic veins uh, or the portal veins. So once the veno-atrial communication is determined, then we see for the atrioventricular connection. So the atrioventricular connection is said to be concordant if the right atrium is draining into the right ventricle and the left atrium is draining into the left ventricle. And it is discordant when the right atrium drains into the morphological left ventricle and the left atrium drains into the morphological right ventricle. The atrioventricular connection can also be double inlet where both the atria drain into a single ventricle. There can be an absent right or a left connection, especially in cases like tricuspid atresia or mitral atresia. And there can be cases which, are, which the atrioventricular connection is ambiguous. So, uh, cases like crisscross heart or a large AV canal defect, we are not able to a single with a single atrial morphology, we won't be able to determine the uh, atrioventricular connection accurately. Coming to the ventriculo arterial connection, which is the next step in blood flow. So it is the connection between the ventricles and the major arteries. So a ventricular arterial connection is concordant when the RB is draining into the pulmonary artery and the LV is draining into the aorta. And it is discordant in transposition of our great arteries. The ventricular arterial connection can also be a DORB, which is double outlet right ventricle, where both the major arteries take off from the right ventricle, or double outlet left ventricle, where both the arteries take off from the left ventricle. And it can be a common vascular channel that is coming from the ventricles, which is in which case it is called as a truncus arteriosus. So once we have gone through the segmental segment, the three segments and followed the blood, then we look for other associated abnormalities. Uh, when we look for other associated abnormalities, we first start with looking for shunts. So atrial septal defect is one of the most commonest uh, shunts that we encounter. So you can see there is a defect between the right and the left atrium. Ventricular septal defect, 
So this is a ventricular subiotic ventricular septal defect that is seen. Uh, presence or absence of outflow obstruction, both RVOT and LVOT. So this is a case of tetralogy of fallow where you can see there is an infundibular narrowing. This is the right ventricle, this is the main pulmonary artery and there is an infundibular narrowing. Presence of patent ductus arteriosus. So here you can see a communication between the pulmonary artery and the iota. Presence of uh, coarctation of iota and its morphology. Uh, if, um, in, especially in cases of coarctation, we would also uh, like to see the involvement of other vessels. In this case, you can see that the left subclavian artery is taking off from the coarcted segment. So these are the information that are very important for surgical planning of these cases, which might not be very easy with uh, echocardiogram. Then we also look at the branch and distal pulmonary arteries to look for any AVM or fistula. Look at the iota for the presence of MAPCAS, which is major iotopulmonary collateral arteries. And as I told you, we always cover the upper abdomen while we are doing a scan, cardiac scan for congenital heart disease to look at the portal venous system, especially to look for portosystemic shunts and Abernathy malformations. So to summarize the talk, uh, there are a plethora of imaging modalities that are available to image congenital heart disease. Uh, transthoracic echocardiography is the first line choice for congenital heart disease because of its easy availability and no radiation. Uh, CT angiography, uh, when, when, when can you ask for a CT angiography? When there is a discrepancy in echo findings and the clinical status of the patient, then you can ask for a CT angiography. What CT angiography provides is a comprehensive cardiac and extracardiac information. Uh, the study duration is very short, can be done with just an IV sedation. And it gives us a 3D data set, which can be uh, retrospectively post-processed and evaluated. And CT angio is the investigation of choice for preoperative evaluation, especially of complex congenital heart diseases. Uh, radiation is an issue with CT angiography. However, with the newer, faster scanners, uh, which are capable of doing these scans at a very minimal dose, radiation is becoming less of an issue. Uh, the other choice is cardiac MR. So the advantage of cardiac MR is that it can provide you anatomic as well as functional data of the patient. Uh, the downside is that the study duration is longer. It has a lower spatial resolution. We'll need a general anesthesia or a long time sedation to uh, do the study. Um, cardiac MR, because of its absence of ionizing radiation is the ideal modality for post-operative evaluation, especially when you're following up the patient. And cardiac MR is the gold standard for ventricular volumes, both right and left ventricular volumes and calculation of regurgitant fractions in post-operative patients. And transesophageal echocardiography is pretty useful in, as a problem solving tool, especially in special scenarios when thoracic echocardiography is inadequate and it's also useful for intraoperative monitoring. So segmental approach to congenital heart diseases is mainly there to declutter the image interpretation and the reports. And the segmental approach uses the Van Prague notation system, uh, where it consists of series of three letters to denote the visceral situs, the ventricular looping, and the conotruncal or great artery relation. So the visceral situs consists of three parameters, S for solitus, that is normal, I for inverses, and A for ambiguous. And the ventricular loop can be either a D loop, which is normal, and a, or a L loop, where the ventricles are changed the size. And the third conotruncal relation or the great vessel relation can either be solitus, inverses, or a D transposition or L transposition denoted by the letters D and L. And lastly, we also look at the cardiac orientation uh, on which direction the apex is pointed. We look at the intracardiac as well as the extracardiac shunts and other associated abnormalities. So when you look at a congenital heart disease report, you see something like this, where all the information that is needed for the clinician is given in a simpler way. And the moment you see that SDS levocardia, this means that this is a visceral situs is solitus, which is normal. This is a D loop ventricle and the great artery relation is solitus with a levocardia, which means that the apex is uh, directed towards the left side. And this is followed by 
any other associated abnormalities that are present. So in this particular case, there is pulmonary infundibular narrowing with a subbiotic VSD, which turns out, which then gives us the diagnosis as this is a case of tetralogy of fallow. But sometimes things are not as straightforward. You get a lot of complex congenital heart diseases where the um, relation between the cardiac structures and the visceral structures and the intracardiac structures are messed up. So in, even in these cases, uh, the uh, segmental approach to these types of cases will give a clear cut and an approachable uh, method to both interpretation as well as image interpretation, as well as interpretation of the report by the clinician so that the data that is available from imaging is transferred to the treating clinicians without any miscommunication. Um, and that's the talk. I thank uh, IAP and Dr. Rajendran sir uh, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Any questions? Why we choose this topic is uh, so the pediatrician saw the report from pediatric cardiologist or uh, from radiologist. They need to understand what they are mentioning. What so that's why we choose this basic topic, the uh, particularly in pediatric cardiology. I believe everyone understand this. So I think so. Thank you, Pudivan. Uh, Thank you very much. Kana. Yeah, we can move to next topic. Um, Dr. Rajesh, uh, he's uh, doing most of thoracic cases in our department. So he's a consultant, lead consultant in thoracic radiology. Uh, so he is dealing about neonatal respiratory distress today. Rajesh, over to you. Uh, good evening to all. Am I audible, Kanan? Uh, yes, Rajesh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thank IAP Tamil Nadu Subchapter Association for giving me this opportunity. And I thank Dr. Kanan and Dr. Rajinder sir for constant support. The radiology department. Okay, I will start the, uh, today's topic. And uh, today I'm going to discuss, discuss about role of imaging in neonatal respiratory distress. Neonatal respiratory distress occurs in 11 to 14 percentage of all live births. Incidence of neonatal respiratory distress depends on the gestational age. It occurs in 60% of babies born less than 30 weeks of gestation, while it occurs only in 6% of babies born more than 34 weeks of gestation. Before going into the topic proper, uh, I will discuss about how to read a normal neonatal chest X-ray. Now, First thing, we have to see certain parameters like adequate penetration. It should not be over penetrated. It should not be under penetrated. Second thing, we have to see rotation. What is rotation? This medial end of the clavicle is equidistant from the midline on both sides. If you measure the distance between the medial end of clavicle to the midline, it should be equidistant on both sides. Minor degree of rotation is acceptable, but if there is grass rotation, so it will give false interpretation of uh, findings. So that in that time, we have to repeat the film. Then we have to see we have pattern. Either we have to start from center to periphery or periphery to center so that we won't miss any abnormalities. So first thing, we have to see the trachea, whether the trachea is midline or deviated to right or left side. If it is deviated, then we have to search for underlying abnormality. Then we have to see the mediastinal contour, whether the mediastinum is normal or enlarged. Then we have to see the cardiomegaly. 
where the hot border is normal or is enlarged. Then we have to see the hilum. So this point is a hilum, right hilum, and this is left hilum. Then we have to see the diaphragm. Usually, this anterior end of the sixth rib cuts at the level of dome of diaphragm. It indicates adequate respiration. So this is diaphragm. Then we have to see cardiophrenic angle and costophrenic angle. Then we have to see the lung for any pattern recognition. So initially we have to start with apex. What is apex? So portion of clavicle above the portion of lung parenchyma above the level of clavicle is apex. Then we have to see zones. So first and second intercostal space constitute upper zone. Third and fourth intercostal space constitute mid zone. Fifth and sixth intercostal space constitute lower zone. So always you have to compare with opposite side. Then finally, we have to see the bones and soft tissue. So if you follow the pattern, then we won't miss any abnormalities. So neonatal chest will be of trapezoid morphology. Here the ribs will be horizontally oriented and parallel to each other. In X-ray, neonatal X-ray, we have to include supraclavicular fossa and superior aspect of the abdomen. So this is grossly rotated fluid. If you see the medial end of the clavicle on the right side is here and left side is here. So this is grossly rotated fluid. Next, there are few signs which normally you will see in the neonatal X-ray. One is thymic wave sign. What is thymic wave sign? This is due to indentation of thymus over the ribs, which will give rise to wavy border of in the uh, uh, margin. So this is thymic wave sign. This is normal. And another is thymic sail sign. So this is thymic sail sign. What is that? The short inferior margin of the thymus, which gives rise to triangular opacity. This is not uh, abnormal finding. This is normal. This is due to thymus. So we have to appreciate this sign because in uh, nemo mediastinum, in sorry, in uh, nemo thorax, we will see uh, spinnaker sail sign. I will describe it uh, later. So coming to the topic proper, respiratory distress in neonates. So how to approach? First, it is classified into medical causes and surgical causes. So the first step is to see whether the baby is preterm or full term. Because in preterm, uh, we will have some conditions. In full term, we will have few conditions. So first step in the approaches to see whether the baby is preterm or full term. Second, uh, second step is to see whether the findings are focal or diffuse. Usually, medical conditions will have will cause diffuse disease and surgical disease will have focal uh, disease pattern. In preterm uh, baby with diffuse pattern, we will have highly membrane disease. In full term baby with diffuse pattern, we will have transient tachypnea of newborn, meconium aspiration syndrome. Uh, neonatal uh, pneumonia depends upon the uh, organism. It can be uh, focal or it can be diffuse. Surgical disease usually it be focal. At birth, we can diagnose congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In postnatal period, you will have CPAM, congenital lobar emphysema, and vascular ring. We will see each condition in detail. And also, we will see how to differentiate each condition from others. So, first, you will see approach to medical disease. So this is hyaline membrane disease. So what is hyaline membrane disease? This is also called surfactant deficiency disorder. So surfactant is a lipoprotein produced by type 2 pneumocytes. So this surfactant which helps in reducing the surface tension within the alveoli. So thereby helps in lung expansion during respiration. In patients with hyaline membrane disease, there will be deficiency of surfactant. So there will be increased surface tension within the alveoli. So there will be reduced lung complaints. So the lung will go for adelectasis. Adelectatic lung will be hypoaerated or underaerated. So there will be volume of the lung will be reduced. So the main finding in hyaline membrane disease is low lung volume. If you find hyperinflation, then you can exclude hyaline membrane disease. The radiographic pattern of hyaline membrane disease is, depends upon the severity of the disease. In the initial stages, 
we will have mild reticulo granular appearance. In the first x ray, we are seeing mild reticulo granular pattern in both lungs, which form mild ground class pattern. As the severity of the disease increases, we will have abrongogram. So, this second x ray, we are seeing multiple abrongogram. So, why this abrongogram is formed? So, air in the alveoli is replaced by fluid. So, now we are seeing fluid filled alveoli through air in the bronchioles. That forms the basis of air bronchogram. In the severe stage, we will have bilateral, symmetrical, confluent, fluffy opacities, alveolar opacities in both sides with air bronchogram, which obscures the cardiophrenic borders. Normally, you will see cardiophrenic borders here, but here we can't differentiate the cardiophrenic borders. So bilateral, symmetrical, confined opacities, which obscures the cardiophrenic borders. So that also called white top line. So this one we can see in the severe stage of hyaline membrane disease. So in the first stage, we will see mild reticulogranular pattern or mild ground glass opacities. As the severity increases, we can see, we can appreciate air bronchogram as we see in the second uh, X-ray. As it is more severe, then we will see bilateral, symmetrical, confined alveolar opacities with obscuration of cardiac borders. Now, now X-ray are also useful in monitoring the response to treatment. So here we are seeing two X-rays. The first X-ray taken in a neonate born at the 30 weeks of gestation. We are seeing some confident fluffy opacities. Now the second X-ray taken after 18 hours of starting the surfactant treatment. Now, in the second X-ray, volumes of the lung is normal and there is significant reduction in the uh, opacities. So, X-rays are also useful in monitoring the response to treatment. Next, X-rays are also useful in assessing the complication. For example, in this case, we are seeing linear lucencies. So, this is due to pulmonary interstitial emphysema. And here we are seeing pneumothorax, lucencies with absent vascular marking. This is pneumothorax. This is again, we are seeing pneumothorax with the thymic spinnaker sign. This th the thymic spinnaker sign is due to air outlining the thymus. Here the thymic lobes are laterally displaced. So by that we can differentiate normal thymic sail sign from thymic spinnaker sign. In no uh, thymic sail sign, the lobe will be normally oriented. Where in spinnaker sign, time, uh, the timing lobes are laterally displaced with air outlining the lobes. Yeah. And then this is pulmonary hemorrhage. So we are seeing multiple lucencies and multiple opacities. This is, uh, this is a, uh, one of the complications of hyaline membrane disease. Next, is there any role of ultrasound in diagnosing the hyaline membrane disease? There are several studies which have proved that ultrasound has significant role in diagnosing the hyaline membrane disease. In normal ultrasound, if you see, we can see multiple A lines. A lines are horizontal lines, which is which are the repetitive artifacts from pleura. But in hyaline membrane disease, we will see absent A lines. We can't see any A lines. Instead, we will see multiple coalescent B lines. B lines are vertical lines. So these are all B lines. These are vertical lines. So uh, this appearance is called retro diaphragmatic hyperechogenicity. If you find retro diaphragmatic hyperechogenicity, it is very significant, very specific for hyaline membrane disease. So it has high sensitivity and specificity for hyaline membrane disease. It is also useful for follow up of, follow -up of patient with hyaline membrane disease and also useful in predicting the risk of development of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So this is a bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So uh, the etiology, exact etiology is unknown. It can be multifactorial. Once it thought that it can be due to complication of uh, treatment or uh, end stage of near hyaline membrane disease. If you uh, find the baby with uh, hyaline membrane disease with multiple cystic lucencies with bubbly appearance, then we can diagnose bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So next condition is transient tachypnea of newborn. What is transient tachypnea of newborn? It is a diffuse lung condition. 
occurs due to retained lung fluid. It commonly occurs in babies born at term, born via cesarean section. Here, the vaginal excuse is absent. So, there will be delayed clearance of lung fluid, which results in transient pulmonary edema type of picture. Here, the uh, chest X-ray findings will be, if you see the first X-ray, it is typical of transient tachypnea of newborn. We can see uh, perihilar fluffy opacities. Then we can see minor uh, fissural effusion. Here is a uh, fluid within the minor fissures, fissural effusion. So the patient will have effusion, pleural effusion also. The main thing is here the lung volume is either normal or mildly increased. Unlike hyaline membrane disease, in hyaline membrane disease, volume will be low. But in uh, transient tachypnea of newborn, volume will be normal or increased. By that, we can differentiate uh, hyaline membrane disease from transient tachypnea of newborn. And another thing is, it usually resolves between 24 to 48 hours. This is the second x ray taken after 48 hours. We can see the disappearance of perihelar opacities. And another feature is there is ultrasound probe in this condition also. There is one specific condition called double lung point. That is 100% sensitive and specificity to diagnosis condition. What is double lung point? So, see this uh, second picture. This is upper lung field and this is lower lung field. This is a normal point. So, upper lung fields, you are seeing multiple horizontal lines. These are called A lines. While in the lower lung fields, you are seeing multiple vertical lines. This is called B lines. So, in the upper lung fields, you will have A lines. In the lower lung fields, you will have B lines. So, this is called double lung point. If it present, then you can diagnose transient acne of newborn. So next condition is meconium aspiration syndrome. So it is a diffuse lung disease. It occurs in term or post-term babies due to aspiration of meconium. This aspirated meconium will cause chemical pneumonitis and it inactivates surfactant. So this combination of chemical pneumonitis and surfactant inactivation leads to adelectasis. And this aspirated meconium can also obstruct the airways which leads to airway uh, air trapping due to ball valve mechanism. Now, due to air trapping and presence of chemical pneumonitis, these patients will have uh, air leak syndromes. So what are the X-ray features? The uh, lung will be hyper-expanded, hyper, hyper lungs, and you will have multiple lucencies and opacities. And due to uh, presence of air leaks, you will see pneumothorax. Here we are seeing pulmonary interstitial emphysema, so some linear lucencies. And here we are seeing pneumothorax, bilateral pneumothorax. And this third X-ray represents pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium. So these are due to barotrauma, effect of air leaks. So a term baby with neonatal respiratory distress present with uh, multiple lucencies and multiple opacities with signs of air leaks, then we can diagnose meconium aspiration syndrome. Next condition is neonatal pneumonia. What is neonatal pneumonia? So here is lung infection which occurring within 28 days of life is neonatal pneumonia. Uh, there are multiple pathogens cause, uh, cause this condition. But most common is group B streptococcus. So the pulmonary the lung findings depends upon the type of pathogen. So it can be either low bar consolidation or bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia will cause bilateral fluffy opacities. So that concludes the medical causes for neonatal respiratory distress. Next, we will see about uh, surgical disease. So in medical condition, most of the time with X-ray alone, we can diagnose. But in surgical condition, we need CT. Though initially we will uh, use X-ray for diagnosing the condition, we need CT for further characterization and for surgical planning. Ultrasound has no uh, definite role in surgical disease. Now, surgical causes are classified into congenital anomalies involving lung, congenital anomalies involving diaphragm, and congenital anomalies involving mediastinum. So, first we will see about congenital anomalies involving the lung. So, there are three conditions we should understand. So, what is agenesis? What is aphasia? What is hypoplasia? Now, in lung agenesis, 
So this see the first X-ray and CT, the lung will be absent and there is no bronchus. So we are seeing left bronchus, there is no right bronchus and there is no right pulmonary artery. So absent lung, absent bronchus and absent pulmonary artery. This is lung agenesis. This is the second set is lung aplasia. Here, here also the lung will be absent. Okay, there is no pulmonary artery on the affected side. But here we can see the rudimentary bronchus. So this rudimentary bronchus indicates this is lung aplasia. Then third set indicates lung hypoplasia. So here we can see hypoplastic lung and small pulmonary artery. And also we can see the bronchus. So if you find absent lung, absent bronchus, absent pulmonary artery, it indicates lung agenesis. If you find rudimentary bronchus, if that is lung aplasia, then if you find rudimentary lung, rudimentary bron bronchus with narrow calibered pulmonary artery and the affected set, then that is lung hypoplasia. So this is schematic representation, which represents three conditions, lung agenesis, lung aplasia, and lung hypoplasia. So next is congenital pulmonary airway malformation. Previously, uh, it is called as CCAM, congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation. But now the term is revised into CPAM, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. This is most common congenital lung lesion. This happens due to failure of bronchoalveolar development. So this is due to defect in the normal pulmonary bronchoalveolar development, which leads to CPAM. So there are five types in CPAM. So type one is mal development occurs at bronchiolar or at the junction of bronchi bronchiolar level. So in the type one, you will have multiple cysts with one or two cysts will be larger. That is more than two centimeters. That is most common type. About 70% of the CPAM will be type one. Then type two is development at bronchiolar level, mal development at bronchiolar level. Here we will have multiple cysts, but cyst size will be smaller. It is less than two centimeter. If it is more than two centimeter, it is type one. If it is less than two centimeter, it is type two. So then type three. In type three, there will be mal development at the level of bronchiolar and alveolar junction. So here you will have micro cyst. So we can't find out the cyst. So it will be like a solid appearing mass lesion. Then type four. Here the type 4 is mal development at the level of distal asinar level. So we will have a unique, I mean the single large cyst. Since type 1 also have large cyst, sometimes it will be very difficult to differentiate type 1 and type 4. So there is one other type that recently in the revised stalker classification, they have added the type 0. That is due to severe asinar dysgenesis. Uh, imagingly, we, we can't imagine because it is uniformly fatal. So uh, we can't image it. And another is, there are some complications which happen in this condition. Type 1 babies can develop bronchoalveolar carcinoma and type 4 babies will develop pleuroplastimal carcinoma. So this is another types with uh, imaging features. So this is type 1. We are seeing a large cyst more than 2 cm. This is type 1. And type 4 also, we are seeing large cyst. So type 1 and type 4, we can't uh, differentiate uh, radiologically. And this is type 2, multiple cyst less than 2 cm. And this is type 3. So due to the presence of micro cyst, we are seeing a solid appearing mass. So if in type 4 or type, type 1 or type 4, in the follow, if you find some heterogeneously enhancing mass, then we have to think of underlying malignancy. So presentation will be respiratory distress after birth, recurrent respiratory tract infection. So X-ray, we are seeing some bubbly lucencies at the lower lobe. The corresponding CT image showing large cyst in the right lower zone, lower lobe. This is another patient with CCAM. We are seeing the cyst at the right lower zone, and the corresponding CT images are showing multiple cyst of less than 2 cm. The first image we are showing, uh, this is type 1 and this is type 2. Next, we will see about sequestration. What is sequestration? Here, there is aberrant formation of segmental lung tissue that has no connection with the bronchial tree or pulmonary arteries. There are two types of sequestration. 
one is intra loba and another is extra loba sequestration so how to differentiate intra and extra loba intra loba it is most common type usually present later with recurrent respiratory tract infection here it is closely connected to adjacent lung with its pleura why extra loba will be it will have its own pleural lining so while intra loba has same pleural covering as that of adjacent lung while extra loba will have separate pleural line here the drainage will be into systemic arteries uh, it usually drains into descending aorta venous drainage usually into acega system or portal venous system normally lower lobe is affected so this is a ct reconstructed image showing sequestrated right lower lobe here we are seeing the affected segments drain into systemic arteries so that artery arises from descending thoracic aorta and this third image showing hybrid lesion what is hybrid lesion presence of sequestration and ccap this is called hybrid lesion next condi condition is congenital lobar emphysema it results from progressive over distension of pulmonary lobe that is due to obstruction the obstruction can be either intrinsic or extrinsic usually present before 6 months of age with respiratory distress here the findings will be the affected uh, lung shows hyperlucency here we are seeing hyperlucent right upper and mid zone the ct of this patient showing hyper inflated low with the paucity of vascular motifs then it compresses the adjacent lung with mediastinal shift so if you find a lobar hyperlucency with the paucity of vascular marking with mediastinal shift then you have to think of congenital lobar hyperinflation so this is another patient with left upper lobe showing hyperlucency the corresponding ct image showing hyperinflation with paucity of vascular markings this is another example of congenital lobar hyperinflation so the severity of symptoms depends on the amount of hyperinflation of the affected lobe due to ball valve mechanism patient will have air trapping so patient will have respiratory distress the most common site is left upper lobe next coming to congenital diaphoretic hernia so there are three types of hernia one is bocal hernia second is morgagni hernia then third is central tendon defect this is due to abnormal development of the diaphragm bocal hernia usually occurs on the left side and posterolateral aspect of the diaphragm while morgagni hernia hernia usually affects affect the anterior aspect of the diaphragm usually on the right side so chest x-ray findings initially we will have radio opaque hemithorax then later we will have multiple bubbly lucencies in the hemithorax so we can see the presence of bubble within the hemithorax with uh, we can appreciate the diaphragmatic contour sometimes we can see the nasogastric tube within the uh, hemithorax so this is example of congenital diaphragmatic hernia so at birth first we are seeing opaque hemithorax the after 24 hours this is a x ray repeated after 24 hours we are seeing presence of bubble loops in the hemithorax with contralateral mediastinal shift and this is another ba uh, patient with uh, bubbly lucencies in the hemithorax the ct of the patient shows presence of stomach and large bubble loops in the left hemithorax so this is an example of congenital diaphragmatic hernia so we can here we can't appreciate that diaphragmatic contour as a top on the right side next the final topic is congenital vascular malformation or tracheobronchial obstruction so there are uh, some uh, certain conditions which compresses the trachea which leads to respiratory distress so this condition is congenital innominate artery compression syndrome so there will be right innominate artery compression syndrome here this artery compresses the anterior aspect of trachea so if you find indentation over the anterior aspect of trachea then you can find out you can diagnose this condition 
Next is pulmonary sleep. What is pulmonary sleep? Here we are seeing some indentation. This barium image showing indentation over the anterior aspect of esophagus. So the corresponding patient CT image showing this is left pulmonary artery. Here we are seeing left pulmonary artery uh, arises from right pulmonary artery with indentation over the anterior aspect of esophagus and posterior aspect of trachea. So corresponding reformatted image shows uh, narrowing and we can with this image we can assess the length of narrowing so which helps in surgical planning. So this is another reformatted image we can assess the uh, degree of uh, tracheal compression and length of the compression we can uh, give to the surgeon for surgical plan. And next is double aortic arch. This is most common type of uh, uh, malformation which, uh, which is symptomatic uh, cause of obstruction. He, this is a barium image showing obstruction on both sides. So this is a double aortic arch. So corresponding CT image, that is a reformatted CT image, you can see the double aortic arch. This forms a sling around trachea and esophagus, which, which compresses the trachea, so which leads to respiratory distress. And this is aberrant right subclavian artery, which forms sling posterior to the trachea, causing compression of trachea. We can see the narrowing of trachea. This is an axial and sagittal image. So we can, here we can see the narrowing of trachea. So uh, finally, for medical, for diagnosing the medical condition causing uh, neonatal respiratory distress, we need X-ray and sometimes ultrasound. For, but for surgical condition, we need X-ray and multi-director CT with the reformation for surgical plan. So finally, <coughs> to conclude, how to approach a neonatal respiratory distress syndrome? So first step is we should know whether the baby is preterm or full term. The next step is whether the findings are diffuse or focal. If the findings are diffuse and the baby is preterm, then we should go in the direction of surfactant deficiency disorder. And if the baby is full term and the findings are diffuse, then we have, we have to think of transient tachypnea of newborn, meconium aspiration syndrome. Then there are some other rare conditions which includes diffuse developmental disorder, congenital surfactant dysfunction disorder, congenital pulmonary lymphangiectasia. Then if the findings are focal, then we have to think of surgical condition. If the affected lobe is, uh, if there is hyperlucent, then we have to think of congenital lobar hyperinflation. If there are multiple cysts, then we have to think in the direction of congenital pulmonary airway malformation. In the reformatted image, if you see the artery, uh, systemic artery draining the segment, then we have to think of bronchopulmonary sequestration. There are some conditions which can present both diffuse and focal. The common is neonatal pneumonia. So in this, we have to see the clinical picture of presence of uh, fever, high grade fever with respiratory distress and presence of uh, multiple fluffy opacities, then we can diagnose neonatal pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, any questions? Dr. Rajesh, that was a very wonderful, very useful uh, deliberation on neonatal x-rays and all the other uh, topics are excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, very excellent and very useful also. This is the first of its kind, as doctor mentioned, uh, in uh, radiology in pediatrics. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Sridham Varadarajan. He finished his uh, DM Neuroradiology uh, from prestigious Nimans uh, Bangalore. Then he worked in CMC and he is uh, very passionate about the stroke. Uh, I will give you an example. He, he wrote so many articles, not in pediatric search, even he wrote article in neonatal stroke itself. So that much he passionate about stroke. He can speak uh, one month in stroke also, but I asked them to speak about neuroemergencies, the pediatric neuroemergencies. So thank you, Sri Ram. Uh, you can share your screen. Uh, yeah, now I'm audible first. Yeah. 
Is my screen being shared? Yes, we can see your screen. So I'll just dive in. I think we are running short of time. So the topic that actually I personally requested was pediatric neuroemergencies with an amazing approach and not the whole collection of cases that we generally see case one, case two, case three. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a kind where, you know, just bring in the value addition to it, understand the approach towards the residents. So yes, um, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Kanan. The very close friend and colleague of me. Um, so uh, what do I mean when I say value and evidence? Uh, I'll just, as I show along, I'll show a few slides to explain why combination of both is required. So some of the disclosures before we start the talk, uh, it will include uh, some case examples from one of few of my earlier talks. A uh, few slides are from my poster presentations. And I would say what amazing approach is what we practice. My approach would be different from your approach. So every place would be different. There will be logistical issues. So what I would rather emphasize on at the end of this talk would be to get a clinical discussion where I can then probably relate to uh, from the pediatric side, what would they want? And we're not going to talk about very drastic or abrupt changes here, uh, but what creates value addition in small, small levels. Um, so coming to the modalities itself, we all know that there's a multitude of options available starting from the very basic ultrasound. Even though I call it basic, I think it's one of the most difficult techniques to master. It's bedside, it's real time, which it's highly operator dependent. Um, at the same time, we can also image the blood vessels while doing an ultrasound. And we call it Doppler. If you're going to do a Doppler study of your brain, it's called a transcranial Doppler. Uh, then we do have the CT. There's a big question mark over radiation dose. I would just uh, spend a few minutes on that. And then, uh, which is my kind of favorite, because I kind of work in MR specifically. So I would talk a lot on MR. Uh, CT angios and MR angiograms, the counterpart of your ultrasound Dopplers for the vascular studies. Um, and then finally, uh, you do have a talk on intervention. Now the DSAs. Uh, somehow I just feel people get uh, a bit scared when we talk about angiographies. We must remember whether it's a CT angio or an MR angio or a digital subtraction angiogram. It's all the same. The concept is the same. We are going to study the vessels and the orientation is what sometimes gets misleading. So if you're going to look at it, this is still a coronal MIP image of an MR angiogram. This is the same coronal MIP image of a left ICA injection. So it's, it's not rocket science. So I'll have to declutter that point. Um, finally, PET, I think we had a special dedicated session for it, which is coming up in a big way and so rightly called image gently. Uh, for all of these imaging modalities, there are a couple of important principles that are there. One is called an Alara. Uh, it's as low as reasonably achievable, which means if you're going to do an ultrasound, let's try to achieve as much less of a power deposition in the tissues as possible. If it's going to be a CT, as less radiation as possible. If it's going to be an MR, it's going to be again an energy, energy deposition as possible, uh, so on and so forth. And um, image gently for the pediatric particular age groups. So this is part of my old talks. Uh, we did start off with ultrasounds, CTs, moved on to MRs. Um, you've done the Dopplers, the vascular studies. Are we really progressing? Are we regressing? I'm really not sure. At the end of the day, whatever modality you use, as long as it creates a value to the treatment. If, if there's going to be a healthcare chain and the patient gets admitted, and if there's going to be a clear addition of value because of the imaging modality, I think that's the most essential point and not modality we use, which modality we use. That's, that's, that's hardly uh, the, uh, the most important point here. It is what is the question to be answered. So coming to individual modalities, um, people who are doing a lot of ultrasounds, because there's going to be a lot of overlap. There's going to be pediatricians wanting to do ultrasounds, radiologists doing ultrasounds. There's going to be mismatch and overlap there. Uh, I think they must go through these guidelines and how to practice an ultrasound or a Doppler uh, with respect to transcranial, uh, because my topic concerns neuroemergencies. So you can do a simple grayscale image of uh, the brain. Uh, we all know the neonatal ultrasounds because the fontanelles are open, but as the child um, kind of grows older, beyond two years of age, the fontanel closes. For all practical purposes, 10 months to one year, it's difficult to get a TCD after that. But if you understand other forms of TCD, and not the transfontanel forms. Fontanel is an open window. There are certain other acoustic windows that would allow transmission of ultrasound. 
one is a transtemporal other is suboccipital uh, we also have a submandibular we also have a transorbital so there are certain windows that will allow passage of ultrasound beams and you can image them in grayscale you can see a very beautiful image of your midbrain with the two peduncles and the basal cisterns here uh, similarly you can just put a color on it and that will lead on to your vessel delineation what are the general rule of the thumbs in order to penetrate the skull we would require a low frequency probe which means around 1 or 2 megahertz and you need experience in doing this again and again and again so so i would just say that people who are really interested in ultrasound would probably have a bedside ultrasound machine uh, and then start practicing on it uh, and try to delineate normal structures and go on to then abnormalities what are the indications when do we have to do an ultrasound in an adult and a child you should understand some of them are real emergencies people have even tried thrombolysis using ultrasound that was sonar thrombolysis you have excellent use of ultrasounds if you got a sickle cell child who wants a transfusion you have to decide between this does this child warrant a transfusion right now there are clear guidelines which say tcd helps decide the indication for transfusion you got proving the right to life shunts vasomotor reactivities and these are all adults but nothing prevents a child from getting what a adult gets like a stroke secondly specific to children we can also look at the icp very very upcoming where you just measure the optic nerve sheet diameter and that could probably relate or translate to the intracranial pressure following it up on hydrocephalus assessing hie childs as well as for venous sinus patencies ct the most important point i would want our residents to take home would be the effect of radiation there is a big stigma about ct being radiation and i would always say that you know when i call up my uh, residents pediatric residents also here uh, they are always hesitant when i say can we do a ct correlation we must understand there are specific indications that ct can still override mr trauma being top of the line and we must say that ct is more readily available in many places this was a recent study that came out in nature and uh, sorry in an emergency bmc emergency medicine and they actually found that the three commonest indications for getting a ct scan brain in a child was either seizures head injuries or an altered mental status and as we can see there are clear guidelines on how much dose should the child receive uh, that was applicable sometime earlier that was the icrp 60 recommendations this is the international commission of radiation protection you have the latest guidelines which are the icrp 103 what was really interesting in this study was if you really have a demarcation in your emergency between a general emergency department and a pediatric emergency department they actually found if you have a dedicated pediatric emergency the ct dose for a pediatric child ct was actually reduced and that is quite fascinating because even high volume centers i i don't see a dedicated pediatric emergency coming up and if you have that it drives home the fact we are looking at children specifically and once they go into the ct you have to alter your dose index and the ct dose index and the dose products accordingly so this was a fascinating study what happens here in kmch every ct scan is accompanied by the data on how much is the radiation dose as we can see here here we give it in mas and dlps you have the ct di volume and you also have the dlp so these are parameters of the radiation dose so i would just say it's better to have a pediatric ed tailored scans with a recommended dose which should not be exceeded which is saved at the er and then don't have to hesitate for doing a ct scan uh going on to a ct angiogram or a dsa so if, if ct was radiation shouldn't ct angio be even more radiation and then that's about the truth you can see here when you do a plain ct it's around around 2 millisieverts the dose if you do a ct angiogram it can go beyond 4 millisieverts as compared to let's say a dsa which is roughly around you know 4 to 6 slightly beyond that if you can see the outliers it can even go up to 8 millisieverts but we must understand this is for a single phase ct angiogram so what i what do i mean when i see a single phase things have moved on where we look at multiphasic angiogram i'll show in a subsequent slide what we do here and that's for adults and not specifically pediatrics so why do we do an angiogram is to look at the vessels so what are the commonest abnormality that you can get you will either get an aneurysm which is not rocket science just an outpouching in the vessel you will get a fistula or a vein of gallon malformations you will get an avm from time to time so you must also imagine if there is a trauma causing an hematoma and we are not sure whether the hematoma 
as an underlying vascular pathology associated what if you had a child who had a ruptured aneurysm suffered a fall and then underwent trauma so it's difficult sometimes so you might have to look at a combination of ct with a ct angio in certain neuro emergency situation uh going on to mr which is my kind of personal favorite it's it's quite confusing if you look at all the sequences available you can still destructure it as to the order of priority starting with the diffusion again my uh, it's beyond the purview of this talk to look at physics but just imagine uh, if you're going to write a request form you can have a screening mr which can just include two sequences to look at acute emergencies you can have a limited study because we can also the child might not cooperate and if you have a full fledged study that takes half an hour to 45 minutes it might require ga or sedation but what about if i say a diffusion sequence happens in seconds that's that's now looking even more feasible than a ct right but only thing the ct is an open gap can still hold the child's head mr is not open it's closed you, you the child is going to be inside your gantry quite deep so the child if at all even has to cooperate for 5 minutes to form for us to get a diffusion and flat the sound is unlike a ct it's quite loud and then you move on to something called a gradient or an swa sequence that's just to look for bleed or calcifications you have a non contrast advantage of mr which means unlike a ct if i have to look at my mr angiogram or an mr venogram i can get to do it without having to give contrast the basic t1 and t2 which would be emphasized in your exams gray matter white matter bright dark again beyond the purview of this particular talk you can use contrast for selective situations the machines that we have we got a, a a problem of plenty we got two machines one a 3t one a 1.5 how does it matter you must understand if an institute has a 3 tesla scan available an epilepsy patient would probably fit into a 3t more likely than 1.5 an epilepsy protocol is one specific indication where you would often require a 3 tesla scan uh, but it's not a must sometimes an epilepsy can be caused by a focal granuloma that can be very well be seen on a 1.5 it's just that we won't be knowing beforehand which epilepsy is structural like a focal cortical dysplasia or maybe a, a, a what do you call a mesial temporal sclerosis now is that truly a neuro emergencies they can come up with breakthrough seizures in your ed you can have excellent ambiences you can convert these ambiences into child specific natures that's no longer scary let's imagine a cartoon film running in the mr your child is more likely to cooperate for such an mr it's called an inbore ambiences and if you get that with the scanners these days people who deal with a lot of pediatric mrs i would advise them to get pediatric specific coils in bore ambiences and it comes at an extra cost i believe the management can be made to agree if you can give them the volumes that the pediatric scans encompass and the need to for ga or sedation if you don't have such a back uh what is our approach uh, i usually say ct trauma that's about it otherwise all cases where mr is not feasible it might be technical medical can be any other miscellaneous causes then yes ct is probably a substitute to mr but you need to know what you're looking for ct angios and the dsas we look for vascular abnormalities the multiphasic ct angiogram specifically for stroke these days where we acquire multiple scans we also sometimes do a cardiac protocol screening to look at the source of the clot a uh, pediatric not so much mri if feasible to me is always a choice you have an mr in your emergency which means we do stroke patients in emergencies so every neuro emergency should be able to get an mr if it was feasible if not a complete mr let's say at least a screening mr or limited study so why is this communication between a radiologist and a non radiologist so important you must say in the er in the night you could have junior doctors you might be lucky if you got an emergency physician trained person you might have the pediatric pgs available and you might have the consultant on call you might have a dedicated pediatric icu setup so which means we from radiology have a multitude of cohorts to kind of communicate and converse for first and foremost the most important thing that we require from the radiology side would be to get the context clear it makes us our much 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 easier if you can give us just the clinical context just one word or two word it doesn't take long then it's easier for us to identify and communicate the critical findings third would be is this really important what we might seem or want it to be important might not be the ones you're looking for you can easily say uh, come on uh, I, i i just feel this this child has got a right focal seizures you're telling me something that's there in the right parietal can you some can you tell me that the left side is clear 
something like that and finally if you're going to have certain emergency procedures imaging might also be required to assist in them so what would be the general approach you're going to pick up an abnormality first you got to decide whether it's going to be a focal abnormality a multifocal abnormality or a diffuse abnormality then in your mind you're going to say whether it's fitting into any of these broad differentials the biggest advantage that a clinician has he knows exactly what he's looking for so you can fit it into any of these broad categories a congenital a developmental not so much for your er trauma yes definitely infective and inflammatory conditions most definitely come in the er neoplasms rarely if it bleeds yeah you might have a situation a seizure with an underlying sol vascular definitely i have written demyelination kind of separately because you must understand there's a lot of overlap between a para infectious autoimmune and the traditional demyelination we saw so far which does present a lot in the neuroemergencies what is this slide about it's very simple brain is blessed with symmetry if you have symmetry you know the right and left match if something doesn't match it's abnormal unlike an asymmetry once you see that you have an asymmetry in a symmetrical organ you can easily pick up the abnormality so for that the next thing would be to understand your anatomy these are axial sections as we run down from the top that is your vertex to your skull base a certain basic rule of the thumb for first years out there the left of your image is your patient's right which means you're standing at the foot end of the patient cutting the patient like a bread slice the right of your patient is on your left the left of your patient is on your right i hope that is very clear on top would be your anterior or your head part on your bottom would be your posterior or your occiput you are standing at the foot end cutting the patient slice by slice what about sagittal you are standing by the side cutting the patient side by side which means your face or your front is on your left so let me scroll the sagittal yeah this is a mid sagittal image so this is your front this is your back this is your top this is your bottom why did i stop here at the mid sagittal there is a lot of clues that are there in the mid sagittal image in the midline you should be able to see cisternal space you should be able to see your pituitary cella you should be able to look at your tonsils you should look out for descent a simple thing like a tonsil ectopia or a significant tonsillar descent might mean a raised icp might rethink on your strategy to an lp without an anti edema machine this is your coronal which means you are either sitting in front of your patient or if he is lying down you go on top and look at him and that means again the patient's right is on your left the patient's left is on your right the patient's head end is on your top foot end is on your bottom the other raised icp features that can still be seen even if it's a ct is to look at your perioptic nerve sheets symmetry versus asymmetry midline shift by drawing a line straight in the midline you will have to make sure that you measure the midline shift at the level of your abnormality let's assume you got a bleed here there's no point trying to measure it here because your ventricle is seen so i always say give your midline shift at a specific standardized level if it's going to be at coronal sections at the level of foramen of munro or specify at the level of your pathology the midline shift based on your fox or any other midline structure is so much anything more than 5 is significant a extra axial collection more than 10 is deemed significant an ich volume is again to be measured by an abc to by 2 method so these are certain simple things which are often not given the same importance like a very difficult diagnosis you can do the same thing if you're looking at an mr it's not very different use your ct don't get confused a t1 image means a gray is gray a white is white csf is dark the t2 the gray and white is inverted you have other sequences which is beyond the purview of the stroke t1 is for anatomy and the t2 and the flare is for pathology so same sagittal the same coronal the contrast on an mr is much superior as we can see as compared to a ct what would be a general approach let's say seizures is an emergency the approach doesn't change because it's a broad approach let's say i have a pediatric code in our er now the first thing to be decided would be the er person seeing whether is unstable or stable if he's unstable you're not going to get too much time to go do the mr so you got to get a baseline plain ct but are you going to think of an angiogram on the gantry itself if it helps if the radiology pg 
is given the clinical indication at the same time the plain CT is happening. And then he will let you know if there is an atypical bleed, should you proceed with an angiogram in the same city. The next thing, are there any emergency findings because they might go into surgery. If there are non-emergency findings, which means you don't have too much of a mass effect, can still wait, should you look at getting an MR done. If the patient is completely stable, is your indication better seen on an MR? And then if on the MR, if he start becomes uncooperative, would you want just a screening protocol, which means again, the clinical communication is very important. It will help us decide what are going to be the first one or two sequences. And then you can finish the rest later also. The baseline plain CT is the must if, if your MR is unavailable in your department. And you can get an interval MR then as and when it becomes feasible. What is your role of plain CTs for those who are uncooperative and urgent surgical indications? What are the broad things we are looking at? Acute bleed, frank infarcts, early hydrocephalus. What are the baseline scan looking at? And you can do a follow-up for doing the same things. Sometimes the patient might deteriorate. Now you say that is not an emergency, but you have to understand a stable become unstable means that is also an emergency. Only this time it's happening in the ward and not in your ER. So then the follow-up study is equally important as your baseline. You want to look at what is going to happen. And if you don't have a baseline, let's say the patient comes from an outside scan and that is not being communicated to the radiologist in the department. You are going to get a suboptimal report, but you do have the outside scan with you. So if there is a doubt, you can always get back to us with the outside image and we then do a comparative study. But without that, you want to get a bland room. You look for the same things, whether it's increased, decreased, stable, unstable, any other interval change. Role of contrast, if you're looking at venous sinus thrombosis, if you're looking at any tumors, maybe if the patient is stable, get it done on MR. If you're having an atypical parent, uh, parenchymal bleed, which means non-hypertensive, because majority of the bleeds in a pediatric patient is often atypical, Try to decide on an angiogram stat. You can look at an extraaxial bleed. It can be an intraaxial bleed. It can be ischemic changes or a large frank infarct, tumor with calcifications, sometimes just a past gliosis coming with seizures in the emergency now. You can have a venous sinus thrombosis, which is picked up by the empty delta sign, or you can have an AV malformation. This is like the spectrum on CT that can even be seen on a plain CT because this is plain you will get an hypertense region here in the sinus. This would have serpentine linear vessels. So even though we have given contrast, it's not a must that every time contrast is required. If you're in doubt, decide between doing a contrast CT versus shifting to MR based on the clinical um, status and the indication. The screening MR, two sequences, other limited studies based on the indication. Some advanced studies, again, I will not stress on in this talk. These are the different sequences. Diffusion picks up all acute abnormalities. A flare will pick up a chronic pathology as well as a semi-acute or after six hours, so as to speak. SWA will pick up your bleeds and calcifications. Without giving contrast, you can look at your angiogram. You can look at your venogram. Certain advanced sequences like perfusion as well as contrast. You must understand the primary pathology can be something. It can cause seizures. The seizure itself can cause imaging findings, which means the MR becomes more complicated if you're trying to understand what did my primary pathology cause after that did the seizure happen and did that cause certain abnormalities. I won't go into the specifics of this, just understand the downstream cascade of an acute emergencies can itself produce imaging changes and MR helps us demarcate the primary insult from the secondary insult. Few cases to wind up. Trauma, most important is the midline shift. Decide on the potential for a vascular injury or a vascular event causing the trauma in the first place. A bony injury to look at bone windows and finally other miscellaneous causes. You can get all of them even in a soft tissue. You can see that the bone is displaced. You can get a bleed. You can get pneumocephalus. So use what is available. Change your windows to look for extraaxial bleeds, so on and so forth. An infection will not have a lot of changes on your CT. But the first thing to be noted is where is the sulcal space? We have a previous case. This is a child. This were other adult cases. But even in a child, you're able to see the sulcal space. Where is the sulcal space here in this particular child? A non-visualization of sulcal space with a mild opening of your temporal lawns 
might still be an early meningitis. Use the clinical context, push for signs of raised ICP. Is there significant tonsillar dissent? Is there partial empty cella? If you do an MR, you might pick up something called a MERS or a viral encephalopathy with splenial signal change. I'm just covering from basic to advanced because so as to give the overall view of what can be there. You must understand an infection can cause secondary vascular abnormalities, can cause secondary hydrocephalus. A simple criteria of doing an LP becomes equally important as diagnosing a meningitis. So that is the most important thing. This is also important to say that there is no features of raised ACP. A granuloma can be picked up when you give contrast very clearly. Even without a contrast, you can see this edema. So sometimes it can be a diffuse meningitis than a focal granuloma. And an infection secondarily can cause septic vasculitis and lead to vessel narrowing and infarcts. Going to strictly vascular, large infarcts, then hemorrhagic infarcts versus actually uh, hemorrhagic infarct due to underlying CVT, which means an arterial infarct can bleed. A true proper hemorrhagic infarcts can be due to an underlying CVT. You can also see that MR is far superior because it shows the filling defect clearly on your subtracted images. But you can use patterns when we have bithalamic signal change. Is it an ANEC? Is it a deep CVT? Are we looking at a viral infection? Are we looking at a Robin cephalitis? Or is it a deep CVT? Non visualization of straight sinus is more difficult to understand because you are getting a lot of veins here. So it's easy to miss that the deep system is absent. So again, the context. When we get bithalamic change, we know what we're looking for. A CT can also show such bithalamic change. So a venous infarct is very, very important. The management completely changes. Have a low threshold for deep CVT. Venous infarcts can coexist with artery, especially in the pediatric age group. You can also have meningitis producing CVT, which means don't stop with one abnormality. Overlap between all these things, certain specific conditions. You can have bleed, edema. It can be atypical like a press in a child who, and you might be on some, uh, you might have an hypertensive crisis, you might have just a simple CKD, secondary to nephrotic syndrome, and that produces hypertension. So a bleed can be an overlap with the press. You can have pseudoaneurysms than true aneurysms. You can have mineralizing angiopathies and all of them will present to the emergency. But this takes time. This takes discussion. Yes, there is a basal ganglia infarct. There is suspicious hypertensity within it. It's along the perforator vessels. Can it be a mineralizing adjuvant? You can have suspicious hypotensities even on CT. And those are more difficult to obtain or find out as compared to an MR, but should not stop us from looking in specific clinical situations. This is a Roman cephalitis with cerebellitis, and this is equally important to pick up on a CT itself. So you'll have to understand fulminant cases such as viral brainstem encephalitis going on to even demyelination or an ADEM. You can have cortical juxtacortical changes. A mock can present with an encephalopathy. You will have associated optic neuritis. Sometimes, sometimes you won't have any of the associated abnormalities. You can have cord abnormalities. And sometimes you can even pick up those on a CT as suspicious hypodensities. It's a context that is most important. Looking at the cortex, looking at your white matter, deep gray, optic nerve, spinal cord, having a checklist based on your clinical situations. Finally, the ones that are very, very unusual, rare, but should be known like a brain death. Look out for completely different appearing brain. Totally loss of gray white differentiation. It's there, but it's looking kind of smudged. The ADC and cortex on MRI is off the roof. There is no flow within the vessels. SWA is showing a transmantle sign. Significant tonsillar descent. Is this a neuroemergency? Yes. If not for this child, but what about a transplant? So there are other indications. What about logistical issues? Are you going to withdraw support? But finally, the onus lies on proving that the brainstem is gone and that would require come second two neurologists to certify it's a brain death. But imaging do help. Imaging can help us saying that this might be non-salvageable. Do you want to proceed to the next step? Finally, value addition can come not just in diagnosis. Is this HIE going to be bad? Is this going to be intermediate? Is this going to be good? So the spectrum of changes on your diffusion also is important what day you're doing it. You do it at day seven, you won't get this. You do it at day three, you will get this. So to use the ancillary modalities like EEG, 
and finally simple things like tonsillar descent optic nerve sheet prominence even on a ct makes all the difference so i would thank you for giving me this opportunity again acknowledge both the departments radiology and pediatrics here we have excellent communication rajendran sir is kind of a pillar of support and finally for the iap and the association for giving me this opportunity to reach out to the pgs thank you so much Uh, any queries? Any doubts? Ah, uh, I think so. It's already seven. Ah, uh, we can skip my presentation. I think so. Ah, uh, because it's. Ah, uh, 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 can I can proceed? No problem. Okay, sir. I I will. We are not here. Yeah, we are out Zoom only. We we can turn you no problem. Ah, uh, okay, sir. Ah, uh, I will um very quickly. Yeah, we are having a YouTube live also. It's going on. Okay. So that many of them they joined in YouTube live. Nah, okay. Okay. So already already they are watching. Okay, so you can proceed. No problem. Right. Um. Okay. Uh. Ah. Uh, i finished my pediatric radiology fellowship uh, i will give some ideas about a few newer concept in uh, pediatric neuroimaging so ra radio genomics what is radio genomics so radio and gene so both things so from the image we are trying to make the diagnosis of what what is the possible gene cause it so that is how uh, radio genomics are working what is radio mix the radio mix means if you take one tumor there will be a necrosis there will be a hemorrhage there will be a calcification so many things there so they will these each pixel they go into the data from this data phase use of artificial intelligence machine learning and statistical analysis they come they direct they want to predict the diagnosis and outcome so radio mix it's actually the mr ct pet futures and genomics from the uh, gene uh, ihc immunohistochemistry chemistry uh, microarrays uh, dna sequencing from the genes from both combined radio genomics so radio genomics it's uh, useful for uh, to try to early diagnosis treatment selection Uh, treatment response uh, prognosis that's how it is useful so i will give one example this is the four different child scan all four child have posterior fossa tumor all four are medulloblastoma so if uh, we I give report right there not, not being seen i think you have to start share screening it Sorry for that. Now, can you visible our screen? Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Now, now only starting. Yeah. Okay. Now we have started screen sharing. so uh, one second radio genomics means yeah now it now visible yeah you can okay. see radio genomics it's radiology and gene so from the radiological image we are trying to make the diagnosis of gene what what is the possible gene behind that what is the possible been so it's from the image we are trying to predict uh, what is the genetic phenotype so radio mix radio mix means if you take one tumor Uh, it has so many component it will be there necrosis hemorrhage calcification size so many things are there from that mr ct or pet that data phase from the data phase using the ai artificial intelligence machine learning from the statistical analysis we want to predict the diagnosis and outcome so natural from radiomics mr ct pet images and 
clinical data then genomics from all combined radio genomics so why it is useful it's actually to early diagnose to uh, treatment selection treatment response and prognosis it's very helpful so i will give one example this is a four different childs all have four uh, all have the medulloblastoma so if uh, the patient come with a report of medulloblastoma in the posterior posa uh, you can counsel same as these four different childs because if you take this this location is cp angle here it's uh, adjacent to fourth ventricle here it it is in the fourth ventricle it's enhancing this is not enhancing so all are medulloblastoma only but all are all medulloblastoma it's not same what is the difference this actually the molecular subgroups of medulloma this the first group is twin group this is sonic group and this is group 3 medulloblastoma and group 4 medulloblastoma from the imaging we trying to make that molecular diagnosis we are we won't be 100% all the time but we will from the uh, data all thing we are some 70 to 80% we are good so why it is important if it is this bin group this survival is very good so you can counsel the patient according to that this the group 3 group it's a very poor uh, prognosis so you need to counsel that way so it's not just a medulloblastoma after that there are so many molecular subtypes are there you need ihc for that but uh, you can predict that molecular subtype through the imaging so that is where the radio genomics playing the role It's not for prognosis alone if you take sonic group that has different pathway this wind group that has different pathway so they are giving targeted therapy according to this according to which pathway it's affecting which pathway is not affecting that's how this is working so coming to next this uh, uh, fetal mr uh, so fetal mr is another newer concept it's not newer concept we are using regularly so this is very smooth brain so post Uh, this is the post uh, natal uh, mr this it has a very smooth brain lesion cephaly so here how this radio genomics are working so it, this is a two set of brain here this posterior is more smooth than anterior here anterior is more smooth so here posterior is affected means that is lesion mutation if anterior is affecting is dcx mutation why it it is important so if you don't have uh, the conclusion if you if you do it mr and uh, you don't have the conclusion in this cortical malformation or uh, inborn error metabolism so what our uh, neonatologists or genetic uh, person will do so we will do whole genome sequence so it will cost around 25000 but i will give the diagnose it can be a lic mutation group lesion cephaly a lisi mutation group so he will go particularly that group of gene uh, mapping so it will cost around 5000 that's where this radio genomics is useful in a uh, cortical malformation or the uh, inborn error metabolisms so these these are the only group uh, classification of lisen cephaly so according to that lisi mutation dcx mutation arx mutation uh, rela mutation there are so many things are there but this is i can advise them i can request to our genetic person or pediatrician sir this patient has the lisen cephaly so you go for lisen cephaly gene screening or it has he has lisen cephaly posterior pachygyria so go for dc uh, lisi he has anterior predominant go for dcx like that we can discuss so this is the borkovich the great pediatric neurologist and i under fellowship under him so coming to this new cortex so this neurons will be from uh, from the ventricle from inside to outside this is the ventricle ventricular zone white matter neocortex through the uh, glial fibers it's migrate 
so before that we will uh, give this classification like proliferation migration abnormality organization like this so this is the how the migration this goes from inner to out from ventricle to cortex you can actually see this uh, mr in the fetal mr so this is actually ventricular zone this is a subventricular zone this is subplate and this is the cortex so these layers you can uh, we can visualize the fetal mr uh, so this is the 25 weeks so we we need the atlas so compare with the normal and abnormal things we need train uh, in that we can use this atlas as a standard one so when why this fetal mr it's important we believe if the child has agenesis of corpus callosum on antenatal uh, ultrasound if it is isolated antenatal corpus uh, agenesis of corpus callosum the child may have the good prognosis if the child has associated cortical malformation it may end up with seizure and it has the prognosis will be different so for that cortical malformation pickup we need fetal mrs so this is the migration abnormalities gray matter here the pachycardia polymicrocardia uh, focal cortical dysplasia lesion cephalis this we can pick it up so another concept in this cortical malformation it's not just organization it's not just migration uh, it's not just a proliferation so now they come with different group like tubulopathies ciliopathies dystrocalcinopathies so uh, why it is important uh, i will explain see if the patient has uh, dysplastic basal ganglia dysplastic brain stem so it will come in the group of tubulopathies so the tubulopathies itself it has a huge uh, genes it, it is there so uh, we can suggest you go for tubulopathy gene screening ciliop molar tooth malformation jubert syndrome we all know it so it is common ciliopathies so uh, dystrocalcinopathies so these are the brain malformation groups uh, with specific protein abnormalities pro3 this is a overgrowth disorders tubulin disorder ciliopathies and dystrocalcinopathies from that mr image we can come to the conclusion Uh, we can go advise this gene pro this gene panel if i give polymicrogyria that can be the uh, cause for the seizure so why this polymicrogyria happen so it can be due to pro3 related overgrowth disorder that's where the radio genomics comes in the play so not only radio genomics so if you take this child he has ataxia superior vermis atrophy and this is the paramedian uh, pons he has the hypointense signal and here the thalamus there is a signal change t to hyperintense signal change so this is one normal corticospinal tract we can image the cortical spinal tract itself through the dti so this we can uh, diffuse denser imaging we can see the tracts we can see the white matter tracts so here it is here this normal one here it's not crossing so this is actually uh, autosomal recessive spastic atos of uh, charlock sagni its uh, prevalence is in canada and in netherland so the child has the cerebellar ataxia peripheral neuropathy and spasticity why i show this case it's the dti you can image the uh, white matter tract itself you can pick up the abnormalities so this is the recently uh, in kmsh they did this is the normal one so this is the broca's normal uh, speech area this is the light up uh, this actually uh, the speech area comes into the right side so the lateralization happen in right side not in the normal left side so his broca's speech area is in the right side so you can see the you can uh, image the cortex uh, and function of the function of the cortex through the functional mrs so uh, this another 9 uh, year child with the tremors so this is the flare signal change and t1 there is a signal change and here there is a basal ganglia in the uh, 
globus pallidus putamen signal change this child has hypomyelination so uh, hypomyelination the previous uh, teaching is the there will be a deficient of myelin it is not always true there is a deficient of myelin but that myelin itself defective also so it can, it it need not be normal myelin so that's why they come with newer classification of hypomyelinating leukodystrophy this is a pathology based classification so this is the primary myelin disorder or leukoaxonopathies or neurogenic disorder or astrocytopathies so again that you need to screen that particular gene group so when to suspect hypomyelination uh, i can skip this so prominent nystagmus relatively preserved cognition this all you know why that is important even though you have the functional mr uh, you have the dta you have the radio genomics you have so many things you have three tesla still the clinical clue the clinical diagnosis is a main pillar for pediatric neuroimaging some spotters you can pick it up but it is not always you we need to speak with our pediatrician sir i, I suspect this what is your diagnosis then he will uh, come with his clinical diagnosis sir uh, you check for some cataract then from this imaging or from the clinician we need to correlate we need to discuss then only we can give the correct or near correct diagnosis to the patient and it will help the patients i will these are the neurological uh, some clinical diagnosis and uh, this is the clues to that this uh, child uh, come with seizure so this child has a prominent mps prominent vr spaces so i thought about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis then i discuss with our clinician suddenly he give on history he has congenital cataract surgery then i again i just go and read about it and so from that prominent vr spaces with this cataract surgery it can be galactosemia and mps or can be in low vis or it can be trisomy abnormalities then i screen that kidney he has some mild uh, nephro uh, that uh, nephrolepsis nephrocalcinosis that uh, medullary nephrocalcinosis and osteoporosis then i gave the diagnosis it's a oclo cerebro renal syndrome lovis so that's how the the pediatrician and this imaging specialist need to work together because the pediatrics itself your ocean uh, we, the the radiologist won't know Yeah, everything so we need to discuss sir this can be the possible so so what is your clinical thing so what can be then you correlate and you need to give the diagnosis you, we can't just write correlate clinically we need to discuss with pediatrician then only we can come to the conclusion uh, the last part of this uh, is about we conduct a on study in developmental delay uh, with our pg so we analyze Ten year case who are refer as developmental delay. So there are so many things. So this uh, uh, perisylvian fascia uh, gliosis. These are the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. This is a peripheral pattern, and this is the central portion. And here this posterior predominant signal change happen in hypoglycemia. And here the tonsillar herniation, the uh, charyon malformation with hydrocephalus. and here the posterior force assist with vermis rotation dandy walker malformation so this actually cerebellar pontus cerebellar hypoplasia uh, pch9 the tubulopathy comes here this is the molar tooth sign elongated thick and superior cerebellar pedangal jupert syndrome uh, this cortical malformation hydrotopias pmgs polymicrogyrias This is the polymicrogyria, pachycardia, focal cortical dysplasia, and this the dark thalamus happen in Crabbe's disease, and here the prominent VR spaces happen in mucopolysaccharidosis. Here this anterior temporal cyst happen in cystic leukoencephalopathy without megalencephaly, 
and this is a symmetrical optic atrophy with cerebellar signal change it's mitochondrial disorders diffuse cerebral atrophy and diffuse cerebellar atrophy so total 120 cases the mostly it's a hie pattern but normal is 44 so 44 percent of mrs are normal but the child has developmental delay so that can't be normal you have 3t you have 70 some experimental universities uh, you have dta you have diffusion you have uh, uh, sw you have functional mr you are mrs mr spectro so so many development happen still our science is not evolving that much to 100% pick up the disease so uh, you can call it uh, our science is still evolving one we are giving the evidence based diagnosis only so from this we are come to so uh, today i give uh, so this brainstem abnormality it can be a tubulopathy next day when i wake up uh, some other paper come with so this abnormality with happen in another gene also so still it's evolving but still we are not 100% so the normal 44 40% uh, mrs in developmentally delayed child you can imagine uh, our pediatric neuroimaging science or our science is still far to reach so this is our uh, this is my talk about uh, thing uh, the, this is the last slide still the clinical finding signs and symptoms it's still it is uh, it makes the diagnosis see the child with double vision ataxia the lesion in the pontine so this child has the hypopigmented macula and uh, uh, vomiting so it's a subepidermal jansel osteosynomal tuberosclerosis he has impaired abcus and nystagmus so the lesion is in the pineal gland the child has left-sided weakness, the lesion in the right side, choroid flexus carcinoma. So the child has headache, vomiting, and right side weakness. So this atypical teratite rhabdite tumor. So he has a left to focal scissors. The lesion is right side, GPM. Uh, hearing loss, ataxia, ependymoma, the early morning vomiting, headache, double vision, jawline pilocytic osteocytoma. So so this is my uh, end of my talk. So still the clinician, it's his, uh, his mastermind behind to give the diagnosis. The radiologist alone can't work and give the uh, near perfect diagnosis. We have so many development, radio genomics, radiomics, fetal MRs, DTA, functional MR, still our 40% developmental delay child scans are normal it's not near normal but we are giving normal report thank you thank you for this wonderful opportunity rajendran sir and iap thank you yeah thank you kanan and uh, really it's a uh, uh, wonderful talk and by ing and uh, uh, radiologist and particular interest in uh, pediatric now i request our uh, Chairperson, Dr. S. Vengdaisvan, sir, past president of IAP TNC, uh, to comments. It's really an excellent session. The presentation was... No, no, I'm here to put slides, sir. Stop, please. Okay. Presentation was very, very excellent. And actually, I thought, uh, since radiologists are going to talk, I had a feeling that uh, usually radiologists will more focus on their physics and all. But uh, today's talks are more concentrated on clinical side. So that is nice and excellent. Each and every topic was very useful. And uh, as what uh, Dr. Kannan told, it's always clinical radiological diagnosis at the end. So most of the time, the clinical signs and symptoms contribute much to make a perfect diagnosis. As what he has told, uh, they would have given a normal study of a brain. But at the same time, there will be neurological manifestations. So
So unless otherwise you correlate some of the findings in the imaging and with your clinical signs and symptoms, you cannot make a better diagnosis. That is one of the, because around 50% of the cases, you need definite clinical features. So that's why there should always be a coordination between a pediatrician and radiologist whenever there is a doubt in making a diagnosis. Uh, so I thank all the faculties. They have done their uh, best for pediatricians and we are very much benefited. And as a, a radiologist come pediatrician, I am very much satisfied in all the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Um, uh, Sinivasan, sir, Professor uh, Emeritus. Dr. Jalil, Jalil, I am at first. Yeah, yeah. Jalil, sir. This is one question to neonatal X-ray. Uh, you have mentioned all the radiology manifestations, sir. Can this ultrasound, that is the bedside ultrasound, can make a replace for the X-ray, make a diagnosis of hyaline membrane disease? Because you said it is 10 to 11% occupies the major chunk of respiratory distress in a newborn. And uh, now the point of care is uh, becoming very fast. So can it be, can it replace the radio uh, X-ray with the ultrasound? That's what they say, sir. Recently, I listened to a talk by Dr. Gangay uh, Muttu, this in Kartikeyan. Okay, in, uh, you were also there, I think, that IA, IA Perispirate in Karnataka. So they have done and it has been published also. So they said that, you know, right from uh, infections and there we have now, and it is everything can be found out. And uh, there is, uh, you know, because of the radiation hazard, they are thinking of uh, replacing it. That's what today we had a meeting in uh, Chennai and uh, Rainbow Chennai people had come and uh, three of them uh, were giving a talk and we said, so they're talking about the step with uh, ultrasound facility in uh, France. Okay, I said, uh, actually we are learning so many unnecessary things in MBBS curriculum, but it's very important that uh, this thing, you know, ultrasonography and radio, this thing, you know, is uh, incorporated because, you know, so much of biochemical knowledge and other things are, uh, you know, driven into our mind, but we forget. But this is, you know, very important and I think it should be incorporated in the undergraduate curriculum. That's what I made a comment. I hope you all agree because we have been uh, holding high posts in uh, pediatrics platform. So you should uh, convince the government to change the policies to include it in the curriculum. And it's easy to learn at a very young age. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Rajesh is there. Can you comment, uh, Dr. Jalil? Uh, sir, uh, uh, I will uh, tell him. Yeah, sir. please, come on, please. Yeah, the ultrasound can replace that, but the how much confident you have with your uh, radiologist. If I give the hyaline membrane disease in the ultrasound, uh, if you are convinced, I am okay with that. Because papers are there. It, it takes time. It takes time. You know? So uh, initially, of course, uh, there will be I, both, I of, both you, uh, will be necessary. Okay. But then, of course, gradually with confidence increasing, you know, I think uh, there will be a day when uh, things will change. What I have observed, because Getting the x-ray done and reporting and interpreting, it definitely to take two to three hours in an NSU. Whereas if there is a point of care... The Sometimes they don't even uh, remember to get the x-ray. X-ray was taken, pneumoperitoneum was there and uh, pneumothorax was not there. Next day they are correcting the x-ray, but the patient will not be there. This has happened. Yeah, correct, sir. But hey, what happened now? I need a training. So I think you can't uh, expect all the NSU. Uh, to trained uh, radiologists or trained neonatologists to pick up this uh, ultrasound finding. That's very important thing is uh, training. If I think it's a uh, uh, training, if I uh, get everybody get training, I, uh, that maybe uh, this uh, uh, ultrasound may be uh, replacing X-ray. Uh, that maybe we can take it. That is but what Dr. Professor. They are uh, interpreting, you know, uh, very yeah. difficult data like uh, you know, calculating acid-base uh, disturbances, etc. This is visual, so naturally it will be there in the brain and they can easily learn, especially at a young age. So I think uh, that should be brought in the curriculum and there should be enough exposure to this thing. But then, of course, there was a technical uh, this thing, you know, glitch because the government doesn't uh, promote ultrasound uh, machines. 
and only few people are authorized to use ultrasound because of the sex discrimination and uh, this thing abortion so that uh, rule is there till then of course one cannot get uh, access to ultrasound machines especially handheld ultrasound machines thank you thank you sir dr srinivasan sir any comments sir for all the people? yeah yeah i i enjoyed thoroughly all the five speakers and i have been uh, posting my comments and uh, really you did full justice with adequate illustrations and uh, excellent you uh, know visuals explaining each and every aspect of it and uh, extremely well chosen uh, faculty and uh, of course all of us are satisfied with uh, listening to you on a sunday evening and uh, some cheers please for us thank you so much తెలంగాణ <laughs> so you are doing an excellent yeah, you are there in uh, so many platforms i am watching you yes sir uh, I, we, i we should congratulate the tamil nadu iap team for having this cme as well as the pg clinic and this radiology is very very uh, important and and i personally congratulate all the speaker as professor sir mentioned about the choosing the topic and choosing the speaker wonderful rajendran Uh, i i must congratulate your team and uh, thank you so much for the platform and thank you uh, vengeshwar sir also you are uh, for your vengeshwar being a radiologist as well as yeah. a pediatrician i yes, think sir. you should impress upon your people we have written books you know on uh, this no. thing i think you should impress upon because younger the age easier to learn all these uh, technologies after all now after the covid you know even house agents are posted in intensive care unit and they have to interpret certain data in the this thing, you know about uh, this thing so it's better to you know introduce all these concepts very well in the undergraduates uh, curriculum and they will learn very fast and they are very essential for life saving that's my comments sir thank you rajendran for allowing me to talk okay. thank you sir yes. i was uh, little nervous in front of venkateshwaran and jalil to give my comments but thank you for accepting my comments thank no, you sir signal vengeshwaran sir has mentioned now i think it's a lesser correlation yeah. clinical correlation is very important i cannot i of course i have to wait for the radiological confirmation of the mr hmd before going for a surfactant but the, this points everything mentioned is absolutely 100% uh, very uh, informative and educative for all the upcoming pediatrician and neonatologists no doubt. thank you very much sir and uh, because of iap dns i uh, professionally thank uh, dr kannan anasegaran uh, he is one of the excellent uh, uh, radiologist and um, and dr santosh and uh, dr um, ram kumar dr pudiyavan dr rajesh and uh, dr sri ram they are very ex- they are young and uh, young radiologist whenever we are approaching you know that uh, they are uh, uh, going 100% uh, in uh, efficient way and they find out the answer that's very important i am uh, i am lucky enough to nalin mehta and cheriyan they were in jipper yeah yeah oh. <laughs> okay so, and i am lucky enough and i am with them and uh, so we are having go, go to correlation and uh, interacting with our uh, uh, radiology department i'm so uh, thankful to them also and i really thank uh, dr kanan gunasekaran who was always with a short span of time and uh, i thank dr vengeshwaran sir always is uh, smiling face, uh, face and uh, always helping uh, our iap tnc to upcome uh, next level i thank uh, dr vengeshwaran and uh, dr i thank dr sinivasan sir dr jalil and all the senior pediatrician who has participated and i thank um, our president uh, of dr ramesh uh, babu and uh, as well as uh, and uh, triple a dr thirumurugan and uh, kobal subramaniam treasurer for this uh, wonderful opportunity thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you all